Hi, my name is Brian Connor Zemma, alumni, as they say, of Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Never trust a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Were you trying to get crazy with this thing? Don't you know I'm loco? <laughs> I want you to try to think back to when you were younger, uh, let's say seven or eight years old. Now I'd wager if you were like me, you probably had a fear of the dark. Now not necessarily the dark itself, but what lurked in it. I think most children do have this, this innate uh, foreboding about the things that lurk in the dark. Uh, we're freaked out by it when we're younger. Uh, what's in the closet? You know, what's under the bed? What's that noise in the basement? Is there something lurking down there? We have this notion in, in our heads as kids that there's something there. There's some nefarious force that is studying us and it's waiting. It's waiting for its opportunity to lash out and to hurt us in some way. And so we get freaked out by it, right, as little kids. Now eventually you'll outgrow this, uh, maybe with your family's help. I, I remember my father used to love fucking with me as a kid. We watched Nightmare on Elm Street, and his idea of getting me over my fear of the dark was just to scare the living shit out of me until nothing scared me anymore. So we watched this movie, and uh, the next thing I know, about two or three hours after I go to bed, I start to hear this, uh, this weird kind of clinking sound. Well, you know, my, my door leads out to the hallway. There's a, you know, a slight sliver of light that's kind of peeking through. And I look up, and what do I see? Knives. Knives just tapping in a rhythmic pattern on the door. And suddenly there comes a hand with knives attached to it, just like Freddy Cougar. Well, this is my father. You know, he thinks this is fucking hysterical. Uh, I, I can't remember. You know, I think the bed ended up becoming a water bed that night because uh, he, he scared the living piss out of me. But, you know, uh, eventually our parents find a way to regulate this. Uh, we outgrow it, you know, whether that's through cruelty or we just simply grow up and we're not afraid anymore. There's no reason to be. Now imagine instead of actually outgrowing it, you never did. And instead of monsters, it's people. And it doesn't just happen in the dark anymore. No, there's a conspiracy afoot. There's a group of people, a network of people, and they're uh, made up of all sorts of individuals, from the stranger down the road to your neighbor, uh, maybe your best friend or a family member. These people, they communicate with one another, and their primary goal is to fuck with you. They want to drive you crazy. They want to ruin your life. And they're going to do that in any way they can. Uh, maybe you're at the grocery store and you hear whispering and you look behind you, and there are two or three people and they're talking to one another and they're looking right at you. They're pointing. They're pointing right at you. Uh, maybe you're driving on the highway and suddenly you're flanked by cars. You can't speed up or slow down. You can't change lanes. They're all the same color. They're all going the same speed. Nothing's blocking them in. They're just shoehorning you in. So you can't get to where you need to go. You have to go with their traffic. Maybe when you're on the phone, suddenly you hear a, an awkward static. You can't really explain it. It's a new phone. It's got great reception. The batteries work. But for some reason, whenever you're having a conversation that you think is important, all of a sudden that static kicks on. Like maybe somebody's eavesdropping or uh, trying to disrupt your communication. This is the mentality. This is the, the mindset of somebody who believes in the concept of gang stalking. Now, this is a, a relatively new phenomena. It's really exploded with the use of the Internet. Um, not necessarily people thinking that they're uh, victims of some kind of a conspiracy. That's been around forever. But the name and the parameters of what it is and the community built up around it, that's new. Uh, that's been you know propagated and spread all over the Internet. And all these people are, are getting sucked up into this, this idea that they're the victim of some vast conspiracy whose sole goal is to drive them fucking crazy. And so this, this really fascinated me. I wanted to try to get into the mindset of somebody who believed in this, who thought that there was a conspiracy uh, that existed to drive them crazy. And so I started looking. I wanted to find a good uh, representative of the type of person that buys into this idea. And I looked around and I came across somebody. God is cool 2010. Now I should tell you, I've actually had to come back and re-edit this video because of something that's happened. Um, in the course of making it, originally I was going to upload it a few days ago, uh, I tried to contact the person who owns that account. Now I'm not sure if it's because I reached out to them to try to get a better understanding of what they think, or if it's some unrelated thing. But they closed the account down. It could be for a number of reasons, and I'll actually talk about what I think it might be at the very end, but it, it presented some problems. One, I lost a lot of the video I wanted to use. Um, the reason that God is Cool 2010 is such an interesting case is it shows what happens when you present a crazy idea to somebody who's already unstable mentally. 
if you were to look at the videos, the, um, the first videos he put up when he opened that account, what you would see is a man who is obviously dealing with some kind of a mental instability. Now, he's a very soft-spoken gentleman. Um, he slurs his words. He might have a speech impediment, but there's nothing striking about him. There's nothing that you would, you would look at him and you'd say, oh yeah, that guy's got a mental uh, defect. Oh yeah, that guy's um, schizophrenic or uh, depressed. He, he seems like a normal guy, and in those original videos, he looked like a normal guy. But over the course of the years that he had this account, it just went downhill. And the point that it started to go downhill is when he got introduced to gang stalking. And so I'm looking at this account, I'm watching these videos, and I'm like, holy shit, this is the perfect example to use uh, for this sort of situation. And so now you can see my problem. Uh, you know, I've lost a lot of these videos. Luckily, I was able to get um, the good ones, the ones that really kind of help, you know, show the narrative of his descent into madness, so to speak. And it's this first video, um, and now I've shortened a lot of these for time. Uh, a few things you should know going into this. I'm not very good with audio editing. His videos have a lot of white noise, a lot of background noise, clicks and bangs. I can't edit that out. Uh, and so, you know, they're going to sound a little off. Um, also, I'm going to leave them at their original resolution. I'm not going to try to to stretch it or distort it. And to top it off, he has a very awkward way of editing his videos. I've tried to cut a lot of that out. But you'll see what I mean when you come across it, because it's hard to miss. So, uh, again, a lot of these have been edited for time to try to keep this video under a fucking hour long. But we're going to take a look at his... This is the first video of his I saw. And it is the best example of if you've ever been around somebody, right? And they look totally normal and they act totally normal. And you're sitting down and you're having a nice conversation. And as you get deeper into that conversation, things start to go really, really strange. I mean, really bizarre to the point where you think they're almost putting you on. You know, like they're they're fucking with you, just having a little bit of fun. And then you have that realization, holy shit, this person's crazy, like legitimate fucking crazy. This video is that um, encounter. This video is that situation. And you'll see what I mean. We're going to queue it up. Take a look. I uh, f worked as a flight instructor at Embry-Riddle for two and a half years after I graduated. And as, uh, as young eagles, people from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, as, as newborn eagles fly high in the sky and with an eagle eye see all that they can see from that altitude and, and nobody can touch them and nobody can stop them. There's nothing that can hide from the piercing eye of an eagle. <laughs> All right, so a few things to start with. Uh, he has an interesting way of speaking. He kind of reminds me, especially his mannerisms when he talks, of Nicolas Cage doing a character. Even his smile and his laugh are very uh, Nicolas Cage. You know, if he started screaming about the bees, that would fit in perfectly with how he's acting. Um, now, I looked into Embry-Riddle aeronautical university and it's actually a pretty prestigious private college where you go to learn to fly um, they're located in a couple of states I believe he went to the one in Florida based on what he's going to talk about in a little bit here but so far it seems okay uh, you know he seems a, a little a little different but you know nothing too strange but you'll see how quickly that's going to start to change over the course of this video so let's continue when we're when we're standing on the earth with our own two god-given feet and moving about with the education that we receive at the university we have eagle eyes we can see all that there is to see and nobody can really do anything to stop us because we're worthy of that privilege okay so now we're starting to get a little a little creepy but it's still so far nothing too bad I mean he seems enthusiastic about his education he likes that he's a, a pilot you know that, that that was his profession I can understand that I went to St. Augustine Florida where my soulmate was who I had uh, met online actually it turned out she was my soulmate though and was in St. Augustine Florida so I went down there and I found out that as a as a newborn eagle uh, there's a lot to see for a newborn eagle and she told me that she was sexually abused as a child she told me when we were up north because she was too afraid 
to to say anything about it to anybody down south where her abuser was and apparently others who had threatened her. She told me about it and uh, I tried to deal with it using all of the applied knowledge that I had developed as a newborn eagle from Embry-Riddle. Now I have to say, I'm not exactly sure how flying a plane is going to help you in a situation where a kid's getting fucked in the ass, but I'll give him an A for effort. At least, you know, it bothered him, um, and he felt he, he needed to do something. He wanted to help this woman. I mean, that's a noble thing. Again, it's a little awkward to bring up aviation and your fight against uh, child abuse, but, uh, you know, I can't fault him for it. So, let's keep going. And I even investigated the situation. I talked to him directly. Uh, I stayed clear of, clear of, you know, involvement with him, but I did interview him. I didn't want to get involved, and so the best way of me doing that was to go and directly confront the person who was guilty of the molestation. Obviously. She had become pregnant and uh, had gone to the Alpha Omega Miracle Center in St. Augustine. And when it was Child Abuse Awareness Month, I picked up a t-shirt from a booth. I think it was actually from the Betty Griffin house. And wore it on the street corner. I decided to finally try and address this problem because it had gone too far. And you guys need to hear this. Young Eagles. And know that if you pray about this, God will do something and you'll see it happen. And then you'll know what it's like to fly in the sun. And here's where the crazy starts. Uh, again, he seems like, you know, when you're watching this, it's hard not to be compassionate towards the guy, right? I mean, he comes off as soft-spoken and very nice, um, and he is, he's a very nice guy. But this is where you start to see kind of his mental state. And remember, his story started with him talking about, um, you know, going to college, being in aviation, uh, meeting a woman online that he cared for, uh, going to meet her in a, a different area of the state, and finding out she'd been through this trauma, and now he's trying to deal with it. And he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's gonna deal with it all right. And it's from this point onward, again, with keeping that in mind of how this started, you'll see just the descent. It's just so quick. It's so quick. And in the the course of the original video, I'll put links in the descriptions of all of these videos. But in the course of the original video, I'd say we're about uh, a third to a halfway through. Uh, again, I've edited for time, but about a third to a halfway through. I uh, love Jesus, and I wore the. Alpha Omega or Betty Griffin House t-shirt which said no excuse for abuse on it on the corner of uh, on the pedestrian crossing island on the corner of US 1 and 312 in St. Augustine, Florida and a policeman came up to me stood next to me for a while with a big smile on his face after asking me what I was doing there and, and I replied protesting and he asked me if there's anybody else protesting with me I said no he said what are they over there across the street I said no <laughs> there's, I told him there was nobody else when he knew that he had a he stood there quietly with a big smile on his face for a while and then uh, you know uh, 20 seconds maybe I don't know 15 20 seconds 20 seconds I don't know if any of you are familiar with the term uh, crazed look in their eye but that kind of applies to him right now he's his eyes are darting all over the room he can't really stay focused uh, he's starting to talk about uh, how this policeman's interacting with them and being very specific about odd details like how many seconds specifically how many seconds um, this officer you know was doing this and this is really where you start to see kind of cracks in the facade of normality uh, with God is Cool 2010. They threatened to throw me off of the, U, the 312 bridge, and one of them said, Welcome to the South, repeatedly, while they were, you know, in order to scare me, I guess. I, I don't know what they were thinking. Obviously, who knows what people like that are thinking. But that's what they did to me, all because I was trying to address child abuse in St. Augustine. Now, maybe this is just because I'm a northern boy, 
and I don't know how you guys do it down in the south, but generally when I'm interacting with the police, um, it's highly unusual for them to threaten to throw me off a bridge. Uh, that's not <laughs> that's not the the average protocol for interacting with your everyday citizen. You know, hi, how are you doing? Oh, you're going a little fast back there. Could you step out of the car so I could huck you off I-95's bridge? And I also like how he's starting to use the term they. It's no longer a police man, it's them. You know, the ominous they, the nefarious they. Uh, this plays in, too, later on to his gang-stalking uh, fantasies. You can kind of see this narrative develop here. He's already talking about they, them. You'll see that language continued on as we proceed. They committed perjury and and threatened to throw me off of a bridge. It scared the life out of me. They threatened to kill me. Uh, the, the guy, he did like some psychological thing to, 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 to take me down from, from my height. And uh, by saying, you know, I guess that when he was repeating, he said, welcome to the south. And then he would pause and turn and talk to the other guys and turn back and like look at me and say, welcome to the south. And I didn't understand what he meant. And I guess he figured I didn't understand what he meant, so he turned around a third time after a while and said, Oh, did I forget to tell you? And then he paused and said, Welcome to the South. Well, I gotta say, you good old boys sure love to fuck with people in original ways. Oh, welcome to the South. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? W welcome to the South. Now, uh, there was uh, two things that were interesting about that. I don't know if you caught it, but in the middle of that, uh, that portion, that clip, he said, They use psychological mind games, or psychological techniques, to talk me down from my height. The, the guy, he did like some psychological thing to, 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 to take me down from, from my height. Now, he's already talking about a bridge, right? And he made it seem like they were going to throw him off the bridge. But if you caught it, he's saying they're talking him down. So you have to think of this through the, um, the, the goggles of reality. Okay, and apply them to this situation. What's really going on? Well, here's a guy with this anti-molestation t-shirt up on a height on a bridge. Maybe he climbed up the railing. Maybe he's up on, you know, uh, some of the latest work. Who, kn who knows? And here come the cops to talk him down. Hey, hey, don't jump. So I don't know what the welcome to the South thing is, but it's really weird. And it, it, you can start to see this has gotten fucking crazy. I mean, we've gone off on a tangent. This started out about him talking about his college, and we've moved from his college to a chick who was raped and molested to him, you know, being stalked by policemen and random Southerners who keep saying, Welcome to the South. And then they arrested me, and then I knew something was up because I hadn't committed any crimes. And they put me in handcuffs and then turned my body and pointed my head directly at this bridge. Uh... You know they had hand, they had wrongly handcuffed me, and they were and they wanted me to know that they were gonna wrongly do something to me on that bridge. It was uh, scary because my body would have been washed out by the the ocean current that comes underneath that bridge on a stormy day like it was. Uh, there was a kind of a storm in the area, and the waves were high, and my body would have been sucked right out in the water. Nobody would have ever found it. Nobody would have known what happened to me. I'd also seen the swamps in the area, and I was worried, worried that they could dispose of me that way uh, if, they, if they chose to. It's very horrible. Uh, they, they're members of the police force. That's why this sexual abuse victim did not get any justice. Uh, she, told, she had told me previously, she said the police don't care, and when I tried to address the problem with the abuser himself, she got really scared. She showed me out in the dark down the street and said, uh, uh, do you know what they're going to do to you? And she, like, uh, glanced over at a swampy area when she said that. And I didn't understand that at the time either. But later, when they did what they did to me later on, then I understood why, what she was thinking when she said, do you know what and that, by the way, was the uh, edits I was talking about. He'll just randomly cut himself off. I'm not sure if he means to do it or if he's just not very good at editing, but it's always a religious picture, or at least it was in these uh, earlier videos. But again, you can see this, uh, this fantasy narrative kind of taking over for where I'm sure a real story existed. Maybe he really did meet a woman on the internet. Uh, maybe he went to go meet her, and then something happened that got him on that bridge. Something happened that, uh, you know, got the police involved, that got onlookers surrounding him. So you're starting to see the image of a fragile individual. Again, he's not a bad guy. He seems like a very nice, affable, likable guy. But he also seems like somebody who's really, who really has an issue, a mental issue. I'm not sure what it is. I could speculate right now, but there's something going on. And it's pretty clear when you watch uh, this video and if you'd had the chance to watch uh, his earlier videos. 
please help. Please pray. That will make things happen. Prayer works. Trust me. If you don't know that, you can trust me. A flight instructor from Ember Riddle, I'm not going to lie to you. If you pray and believe, God will intervene and do something about all of these victims in St. Augustine. Pray and believe, God will intervene and do something about all of these victims in St. Augustine and everywhere else who are being victimized not only by abusers, people in the community, but people on the police force. Threatened and living in fear. They need our presence. They need us to fly. Please, please help and pray. They're threatening people. Buy and be there and observe. They need us to be observers and to pray. And so now you have a better idea of God is Cool 2010. Again, this was one of his earlier videos. I was lucky to be able to get it. Um, there are a few mirrors out there, too. Uh, so there's a potential that he had an account before the 2010 one, and these were saved, or maybe he just likes to back up his stuff. I'm not 100% sure. But we have an image emerging, basically, from that, that introduction video. All right, it's very clear that this guy is what you would call a vulnerable adult. Um, he has something going on with him mentally. Uh, that's pretty obvious. There's a heavy emphasis on religion with him and on being persecuted and on trying to right wrongs that are being covered up by some kind of a, a conspiracy that's out to um, hurt or slander the supposed victim. So it would have been bad enough if, if it had been left like that. I'm not sure what his life would have been like, but he was clean cut. He, he looked okay, fairly okay, but, but who knows? The point is, it's around this, this time, it seems, and again, God, I really wish uh, the account hadn't closed because you'd, I'd be able to lay this out a little better, but it's around this time that he gets introduced to gang stalking, and suddenly all these delusions he has, all these, um, these conspiracies that are imagined in his mind are now made valid, okay? That's extraordinarily dangerous when you think about it. Imagine a psychotic or a schizophrenic who has been told or medicated throughout their entire lives that what they think is real is actually not real, that they're sick in the head. And then one day, some asshole comes along and says, oh no man, you don't need to take those pills. You're right. There is a conspiracy out there. You're right. They are trying to get you. Think of how fucking damaging that is. And that's what these gang-stalking dipshits have essentially done to him. They've ruined this guy's life. The people that fed him this shit have ruined his life. They have uh, allowed him to construct a completely impenetrable fantasy, and he's retreated within it. All right, and I know that there are there are people that legitimately believe in this gang sucking stuff, but it's bullshit. It's bullshit. A reasonable uh, approach to looking at it, it, it's just there. There is such a thing in life as happenstance, as serendipity, as coincidence. Okay, a uh, shit happens. That's just life. Trying to assign some deeper meaning to it. Uh, because you were late to work, or because uh, you overheard somebody make a joke about you, or because your phone's acting up. You know, creating this idea that uh, those aren't random occurrences, uh, that there's somebody masterminding those whose sole purpose is to make you go insane. Well, these assholes fed him this, okay, this mentally unstable individual, and he literally went insane. So I'm going to show you another video now. This is a little farther on. He seems to move back and forth, and it's hard to place this one because this is from a mirrored account. But you can see he, he looks a little more haggard. And the things he's going to talk about are similar to what he talked about in that first video, but they become more extreme, more pronounced. Okay, now it's not just a, um, a random police officer or onlookers. Now it's a, a real they, right? He has a whole conspiracy ready, and it involves everybody in his neighborhood. Hello, my name is Brian Connors. I live in Pittsburgh, and I'm constantly being harassed by neighbors, people on the police force, and people who are using air raid sirens as well when I go to the second story of my house. So already you can see that um, he looks different. His beard's unkempt, he looks a little bit frazzled, and he's really starting to kind of put together this story of harassment. I mean, it's not just the, the police, it's his neighbors. And they're going as far as uh, blasting air raid sirens at him. 
uh, to try to drive him crazy, to harass him for no good reason. A person who lives right across the street uh, from my backyard pointed a laser uh, sight for a rifle at me while I was sitting in a lawn chair in the backyard threatening my life, threatening to shoot me because I, I, I don't know what reason he had for it. I uh, was watching the neighbors had some kids playing in their yard and there was a little black girl over there and said something that had happened was child abuse because somebody was just going nuts and disciplining one of the children for no reason. And and I and I saw that it was crazy, so I said, "Yeah, that's child abuse," because I didn't want her to be told that she was wrong and to believe that. And so here you can see another reoccurring theme of child abuse, uh, specifically uh, child abuse. It seems to be something that is always at the heart of this harassment he's facing, and seems to be the impetus uh, that sets off, uh, you know, this this gang stalking mentality of the neighborhood and the police force and all these other people involved. And so this guy you know, pointed this laser sight at me from the middle of his living room window the night before the gunshots had been fired, so I knew that that he meant, uh, you know, I'm pointing a gun at you, and it was a powerful sight, like uh, the kind that you would uh, uh, use for a laser, for a rifle, not a little toy. Here again we see uh, another theme that seems to be common in a lot of uh, his videos, which is uh, being threatened with death. It's not just uh, the child abuse that he seems to stumble upon wherever he is, be it in Florida or Pittsburgh. It's the threat of bodily harm, uh, specifically murder. I mean, he's saying that his neighbors are threatening to murder him, and the police refuse to do anything about it because they're in on it. Can anybody help? I'm being harassed and threatened in Pittsburgh. The local police are not only not taking reports, but are involved in the harassment. And I, I just need anybody who can, uh, I don't know, understand. Sadly, it looks like he didn't get anybody who understood. Uh, what he got instead were people who, uh, you know, put forward this idea of uh, gang stalking. They probably saw his videos and thought, oh my god, uh, it's another victim of this, um, this horrible oppression that uh, Americans are suffering at the hands of some network of people who uh, are dedicated to screwing with middle class citizens. Now what makes this really tragic, especially uh, in his case, is he, as you watch the videos, as they progress, he gets more haggard in his appearance. Um, he becomes, you know, just disoriented and disheveled. Uh, he starts talking more and more about the harassment he's facing. But he eventually ends up in a psychiatric ward. That's where these next couple of videos come from. That's the end result of feeding people this kind of shit. Here's this poor son of a bitch who has something wrong with him who really is fucked up, but he's a nice guy, and maybe if he got treatment, he'd be okay. Instead, he got these, these pricks who fed him this uh, conspiracy shit, and it fucked his life up so bad he ended up in the nut hatch. All right, he's in the loony bin right now. Uh, when I talked earlier about why his account might have been closed, this might be a reason. He was making videos in the insane asylum, the psychiatric ward of the hospital he's at. Now, you know, it, it wouldn't be too unreasonable to suspect that a doctor watched some of these videos and thought, you know, shit, this isn't helping his treatment. He's just, you know, falling farther into his own delusion. So we've got to stop letting him have this outlet and start having him, I don't know, open up in therapy. Again, that's, that's speculation, but it seems reasonable. So here he starts, this poor, this poor fucking sap who has these problems and, and he just, he gets manipulated. He gets uh, abused, legitimately abused by these assholes who are putting forward this ridiculous notion of gang stalking. And this is the end result. This is what happens when you feed a mentally unstable person huge lines of bullshit like gang stalking. Hello, my name is Brian, and I'm also a victim of organized harassment. Here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they have locked me up in a psych ward, Western Psychiatric Institute of the University of Pittsburgh, I think it's called, or Western Psych for short. The way they did that was by uh, basically, after her they harassed me for a number of years, got me sensitized to certain sounds, then a couple guys uh, threatened to shoot me. And I tried to report it to the police at that point because were the guys threatened to shoot me, but the local police would not take a report on it. And they were trained not to. And then uh, after he wouldn't take the report on it, another guy 
saw me stand out in my front yard. And so he went inside his house, came back out with a bright red shirt that he on that he had just put on inside his house and when he was in there and he, he came right back out with this wet, bright red shirt and goes like this to me and starts go, and then goes like that and starts going like that and obviously you know, so now you know uh, and so now he finds himself in this uh, institute you know in this psychiatric ward and uh, that's not because he's crazy. No, this is just an extension now of this vast conspiracy of this gang stalking. You know, all the neighbors were in on it. Um, all the police were in on it. You can see the frustration uh, he feels in this video. You can just see it. It's palpable. Um, he's obviously really fucked up about this. He really believes this is happening. Well, now it's not just, you know, all these outside agencies. Now the shrinks are involved in it, too. Now the people trying to give him help are involved in it. Hello. I just watched your whole video. You are right. Do not. And I'm telling you so that you know from somebody else. Never trust a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Because they're, they're not doctors, first of all, but they let people think that they are. They do not have PhDs. They do not have the abbreviation doctor in front of their names. But they let people believe that they do. And they basically are just uh, kids that never, uh, that, uh, never learn to be honest. Uh, they are immature liars. Don't ever talk to them. But if you need somebody to talk to, you know who you can. Well, you can talk to your friends on YouTube here. And what great friends they are. They took a mentally unstable individual, fed him a conspiracy-laden uh, bullshit soup, and then watched as his life deteriorated uh, before them. It, just take a look at this. Uh, you can see the progression of his uh, decline. Uh, it, I mean, it's evident uh, physically on him. Now, if I if his account hadn't been closed, there were so many more videos that um, pointed out, you know, his interaction with people in the gang stalking community. Uh, he had some where he, he was walking around his apartment, uh, talking about his food being tampered with because he saw a video of um, somebody explaining that they tamper with your food. And so he was freaked out and, you know, how do they do that and what can I do to prevent it and, you know, uh, do I need to seal everything up? Uh, there were other videos talking about being followed and what cars to look out for. I mean, these are all classic uh, pieces of the gang stalking theory. You know, the idea that they color coordinate their vehicles to harass you on the road and that uh, people will do subtle things, you know, subtle but vague enough that um, it will drive you crazy and nobody will believe you. You know, like the um, that first story he was talking about, uh, you know, Welcome to the South, before he really got into the whole gang stalking thing. Well, they'd say, oh, well, of course they're going to do that to you because it sounds so ridiculous, uh, who would ever believe it? But the sole objective is to drive you crazy. You know, they want to listen in and um, ruin your life in any way they can. You know, bug your phones, uh, you know, move your furniture when you're not in your apartment, follow you while you shop, uh, shout things out in a crowd. You know, it's just, it, this idea poisoned him. They literally drove him insane. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't uh, completely stable to begin with, obviously not, but they drove him over the edge. And so you can see the end result. I mean, this is, this is the end result of these people and their actions and their community. This is what this kind of crap does to somebody. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, God is Cool 2010 is a classic example of somebody who was unbalanced to begin with and who was drove to an extreme by the crap he read on the internet and by the interaction he had with people on YouTube. Go and, uh, you know, enter it into a YouTube search. Just take a look at the videos that are out there for gang stalking and be amazed at how crazy these people are. Now, they're not crazy like he is. I mean, he is he's legitimately crazy, and that's why this was so damaging to him. Uh, these other people, they're just conspiracy nuts, you know, and to them, it might not be a big deal or it might just be a pastime or, you know, some intricate fantasy. But at the end of the day, they can function normally. To this guy, it wasn't a fantasy. To this guy, it was his fucking life, and his life is ruined because of it. Who are you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm loco? I'm
An innocent man sits in prison. A victim of a corrupt, malicious justice system and a police department that target people who've done nothing wrong. Poor Nick Bates. Look at these headlines. In fact, let's, let's read one of them. This is from the 30th of April. Columbia man arrested for child sexual abuse. Washington Bureau, PA. A Lancaster County man has been arrested for the sexual assault of a child who was five years old when the alleged abuse began. Manor Township Police said they charged Nicholas B. Strautzenberger, 23 of Columbia, with one count of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse with a child and three counts of indecent assault of a child. The sexual assaults occurred at Washington Bureau in 2009 and 2010 when the girl was between the ages of five and seven years old. Strautzenberger was committed to Lancaster County Prison on a $150,000 bail. Well, that is atrocious. And I am here to plead the case that Nicholas B. Strautzenberger, a.k.a. Nick Bates, didn't do nothing. We're going to look through the facts. This is a man who has repeatedly denied that he has molested his half-sister, as evidenced by this tweet from May 19, 2011. Why does everyone think I molested my half-sister? This clearly isn't true, or I'd be in jail by now. I don't know where people are getting this idea that this saintly individual whatever harm the hair of a single child so we're going to look at the evidence we're gonna we're gonna go through Nick Bates's history and we're gonna see where this slanderous libelous lie originated from so just why is it that the police and the legal system and all those horribly wicked slanderous trolls on the internet would target this cherub this beautiful individual why would they harass him and lead to him getting arrested for a crime he obviously didn't commit well I think it has to do with his character, his abilities, his talent. Now, you may not know this, but Nick Bates is a renowned artist. In fact, he's released multiple music albums. He is a, a singer, a songwriter. He plays instruments. And he's used those skills to release these albums on the Internet for free for anybody to listen to. I want you to hear a selection of his amazing music. Because I think a core component of what's going on here is a little bit of jealousy. Maybe that district attorney just isn't as good as he thinks he is in his barbershop quartet, and he can't handle the fact that Nick Bates is such hot shit. Maybe the cow board is a little angry that this sexy, sexy man has the voice of an angel. I don't know. But we're going we're gonna to listen to a few of his songs. I've compiled them for you and overlaid some video of Nick dancing in revelry to his own music making. So let's take a listen. I'm going to do my wife. And also some children in their butts. But the latter is only if my wife says I can, which she probably won't. So I guess I'll just do my wife. Ain't no way! Ain't only raping children and disemboweling and force feeding them their own intestines. Encore. That is a danceable beat. That little ditty, I could be humming that for the next week. That's the kind of song that sticks in your head and you want to share with everybody. So after seeing musical ability like that, I think it's pretty obvious why some people might be upset and want to take them down a peg because they can't compete with that raw fucking talent. Of course, there are going to be people out there who are going to say, wait a minute, Jim. It's not just that Nick Bates is an amazing artiste. It's not just that he has an award-winning smile. There's more to it than that. It's not fair that you don't show people the conversation he had with Anna. Well, let's dive into that. Let's take a look at this nefarious character who is obviously trying to hurt Nick in every conceivable way possible. And let's look at the conversation that took place. Anna, who was it? Nick, uh, 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 Anna. Oh my god, come on, I'm getting excited. Nick, yeah, right now, but once I tell you, you'll think I'm a pedo. I mean, I kinda am, but still. Anna, it was Amber, wasn't it? Nick, uh, maybe. Anna, are you being serious? Nick, yeah, she kinda coerced me. Anna, what does that mean? Nick, well, like, we always talked about me and Joe are going to do sexually, and then eventually Amber wanted to do sexual things, and yeah. One day, she was just like, Welp, I'm gonna suck your penis. Anna. Wait, how old was she? Nick. Uh, well, she's nine now, so I don't know, eight maybe? Yeah, she's pretty fucked up to be a rapist at eight. Anna. A bwahaha. Nick. Yeah. Not my best moment. Anna. Damn, you're fucked up. 
Nick. She started it. Well, um, Amber doesn't know how to wipe, so when I went to lick her butt, there was feces everywhere. So I just licked the cheeks instead. Anna. What? Nick. What? Anna. You licked your eight-year-old half-sister's shitty butthole? Nick. No, just the cheeks. Anna. What the fuck? Nick. I couldn't lick the hole because it was shitty. Which sucks because I want to lick an anus, damn it. Anna. Yeah, but your eight-year-old half-sisters? Nick. Well, I didn't have anyone else. Anna. Dear God. Nick. So yeah. Oh, that's right. I've had my anus licked too. It actually feels pretty good, but I still prefer to do the licking myself. Anna. Who the hell did that? Nick. Amber. And it's clear from this conversation that Anna has entrapped this poor man. She's using his feelings for her to destroy him. You see, the thing you need to know is Nick, he was in love. He loved her so much that he actually drew art for her. That's right, he's not just a musician. This is a man who wears many hats. And one of those hats is graphic designer. Now this is the too hot for television version of the erotica that he drew for. I'll have links in the description. If you want to go and look up any of this, go into the description and you can, you can go take a look yourself if you want the uncensored hotness. But Nick, Nick loved her. And Anna broke his heart because she is a cruel woman who entraps him into saying these absurd things and then just leaves him when she gets bored. You can actually see just how much Nick cared for her. They had another conversation where he, he talks about the things that he likes. So let's read some of that. And we'll listen as Nick pours his heart and soul out to this woman. Nick. Yeah, I often wonder what color her anus is. Because, like, some are pink, some are brown. Uh, I think there's purple and white and red, too. Anna. What? Nick. What what? Anna. That is gross. Nick. Not really. Anuses are my favorite body part. Although, it's also fun to try to picture her whole butt, too. Because, like, she has those wide hips. And also, she once told me she has a scar on her butt from sitting on broken glass. Anna. Bwa ha 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 Nick. Also, she has acne on her boobs. Anna. Ugh. You? Nick. What? I like acne. Anna. Oh my god. You gonna pop them while you screw her? Nick. No. Anna. Ha 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 ha. Nick. But if they look enough like a nipple, I might lick them or something. I don't know. Anna. Oh my god, that's disgusting. Nick, you don't approve of any of my fetishes. Anna. What? Acne? Nick. All of them. Anna. Uh, I don't even know what other fetishes you have. Nick. Oh well, you know about all the butt ones. Anna. Oh yeah. Well, that's okay. But you are, like, obsessed, and I don't get why you don't like vagina. Nick. Because they're gross. This man is a, a connoisseur of fetishes. He doesn't want those gross vaginas. He wants to suck the pus out of pimples and lick shitty assholes. He has high quality tastes. And Anna just couldn't handle that. So she left him. But Nick, Nick loved her. And he is convinced that she still loves him. What a caring man he is. You can see from past conversations he's had about this when it's been brought up about his relationship with Anna that he knows best. They are soulmates. Anna just needs to realize that, that he is in no way stalking her. That's a silly accusation, and that she just doesn't understand what love really is. And who better to teach her than this Lothario, this ladies' man, this gentle, gentle giant. Now, I personally think she took advantage of this sweet, sweet man, but Nick, he holds out hope years and years after they stopped having any contact. Here's a, a posting he put up on a personal journal called Explanation from June 16th, 2011. Explanation. Sup. My old account was Harguruman, but lately a bunch of jerk chantards have been hijacking all my accounts and changing the passwords. It's a long story, but basically they think I'm a lulz cow just because I have a bunch of weird fetishes and I'm all nerdy and stuff. There's a bunch of threads about me on an image board and posters have been trying to get me arrested for molesting my half-sister, even though I can prove that I didn't. But of course, they don't listen to a word I say. It's also been floating around that I'm stalking someone, but that's not true either. The real story is that I met this girl, Anna, back in 05, fell in love with her, and then on August 23rd, 2008, she randomly decided to start hating me and told all her friends I'm creepy, a stalker, an idiot, etc. So now tons of people on the internet hate me. So that's nice. It'll probably be a while until I post any art or anything. I lack a scanner. Well, that to me, that sounds like true love. He remembers the exact day she said, stay the fuck away from me. 
It was August 23rd of 2008. Not the 21st, not the 28th, it was the 23rd, the specific day. He has it memorized, and that is not creepy at all. But of course, those horrible chantards just can't let him have the relationship he knows he deserves, even if everybody else thinks otherwise. And yet Nick will not be deterred. Over the years, and I do mean years, multiple people have tried to tell him to stop pursuing Anna, but he has stayed the course. I mean, just look at this exchange from June 2010, the SMS Titanic. Finally, some new news. Okay, so basically it started yesterday when I decided to try sending Anna a text message. Here are the contents. Hey Anna, it's me, Nick Straussenberger. Whatever. But yeah, it's been a while so I was wondering if you'd want to talk or whatever. I mean, not much has changed with me other than I started listening to new bands. JOJ, Starling, RBF, you know, read the other two books you told me to, too. Loved them. Also been playing a lot of Pokemon in Final Fantasy VII. You should play the PC version. Painting my aunt's apartment for money etc. Plus, I'm less annoying. So yeah, I'm curious as to how you've been doing, so I guess give me a holler. See ya. Wait, why did I say that when this is text and not live? Okay, now I want you to notice something. There is absolutely nothing sexual or even romantic in it, right? The whole thing was a chillax, like, hey, what's up, man? I did this on purpose, hoping maybe, like, it bring back memories of back when we were still friends. Well, anyway, a few minutes ago, this happened. The other person is Kate again? Miles Edgeworth. Never. I repeat, never text Anna again, or I swear to God, I will chop your balls off and feed them to you. Mm-kay? Nick. What? Miles Edgeworth. You heard me, or are you illiterate now? Nick. No, I'm not illiterate, but why can't I text her? Miles Edgeworth. Because she doesn't want you to. It upsets her. If you really want to say something to her, say it to me and I'll tell her. Nick, I didn't even say anything bad. Miles Edgeworth, I know, but she doesn't like to hear from you. You creep her out, possibly because you posted private information about her on your site. Nick, literally the whole thing was all chillax, hey, what's up? What? Miles Edgeworth, I understand that, but when someone hates you, you don't write to them saying, hey, what's up? And trying to do so will not make her like you. Nick, then what on earth will? Miles Edgeworth, nothing. Absolutely nothing. She will hate you until the day she dies, and nothing you will do will ever change that. Every time you try, she just hates you all the more for it. Nick, uh, no. Miles Edgeworth, uh, yes. Seriously, listen very, very closely. She hates you so much, she wants to kill you in a painful manner, okay? Nick, I'm aware of this. Miles Edgeworth, and the only thing that will change that is if you back the fuck off. Nick, I don't think you realize that people can change their minds about such things. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'd like to cut in here and say that this was a very long conversation, but I think you get the gist of it. This Miles Edgeworth obviously is a, a troll. But here is how the conversation ended. Miles Edgeworth, you are just that stupid. Nick, because she will. It has nothing to do with intelligence or stupidity. It's just the truth. Miles Edgeworth, I give up. Nick will not be deterred, even when people openly tell him that she hates him, and she's creeped out by him, and she never, ever, ever wants to speak to him again. That is love. I mean, just what about Nick creeps her out? Sure, he has a few fetishes, but who doesn't? Just because the man likes to suck pus out of pimples and lick shitty assholes doesn't mean he's not a human being with feelings. And he's so good at expressing those feelings. Like this live journal post from 2009, My Bedroom Door Needs a Lock. And I have to apologize, the formatting is so fucking horrible on LiveJournal that this is the best I could make it look. I had to highlight the lettering to make it readable. When I returned home from my dad's last week, I was shocked to find two things very wrong with my room. Both courtesy of my aunt. One. The first thing I noticed was that, dude, my big bag filled with women's clothes I had hidden and my closet was gone. <laughs> This may have been my own fault because I left it sitting there in the closet itself rather than the mini closet inside a closet that it's normally in. Easier access, you know? But yeah, the easier access screwed me over. Not entirely sure why my aunt was in my closet in the first place, though. I mean, the door is closed and it's behind my bed. You literally have to move my bed to get that door open. Plus, nobody knew that I ever used it before. Hmm. But yeah, my awesome skirt is gone, and now I'm pissed. For those of you who didn't catch it by now, I'm a cross-dresser, and my entire family consists of conservative bigots, too. As if I wasn't already distraught enough over not being able to cross-dress anymore, I later noticed that my pillow had been replaced. Apparently, my aunt and grandmother thought they were being nice by throwing out my old, dirty pillows for new, clean ones. 
See, for the past few years, I've had this special pillow that I basically pretend is Anna and cuddle with, you know, just until I can cuddle with the real thing. Plus, I roleplay with it and do the voices for both me and her. Of course, I still do the latter even without the pillow, but still, anyway, dude, throwing out the Anna pillow is massively uncool. By doing it, you're wiping some of the history of me and Anna's relationship from existence. Like the time my aunt changed a letter in one of the letters Anna sent me. I now carry all Anna-related articles on me at all times to prevent this from happening again. Needless to say, I cried for hours, and I'm still crying on the inside. And the new pillow isn't helping me by being a crappy cuddler. Sigh. I am sad. Now, I'm not sure what's creepy about that. I mean, the man is a cuddler. Sure, it's been a year since he's seen Anna, and she told him to never contact her again, but his feelings remain true. I should probably have mentioned he's a cross-dresser. He likes to dress up in lady clothes. But who doesn't? It's a perfectly normal thing to do. If only his bigoted conservative family could just understand that this is how he likes to live his life. Personally, I find his family to be reprehensible. I mean, they force this poor man to take showers. Can you fucking believe that? Nick explains it pretty well in this, uh, this posting in a thread. No, I use soap and shampoo and stuff. The thing that makes it pseudo is that I don't actually get in the tub. I keep my pants on and crouch down, leaned over the tub so that when I wash my hair, the water and shampoo drain into it. One thing you should know about Nick is he hates taking baths or showers. He prefers to only do it once a month. And he's explicitly stated this on Twitter and other social media accounts many, many times. But his conservative family refuses to let him express himself. So what if he doesn't want to bathe and he wants to wear women's clothing and he likes to smear shit on the walls? Did I mention he likes to paint with shit? But again, this conservative family, they're just bigots. Fucking Republicans, am I right? Hell, they won't even let him pursue the things that he wants to pursue. Like making a flash game where you gobble up shit that falls from the sky. Or having a bonding ritual where you shove the feces of another person up your anus and then have them take your feces and shove it up their anus. In this case, that someone would be Maddie, an underage girl he talked to, but that's, that's you know, it's irrelevant. It's not important. What's important is they are oppressing him and making him repress the things he's interested in. And what other interests are they making him repress? Well, I'll let Nick explain it himself. Okay, obviously rape is bad. I'm not saying legalize rape, I'm saying legalize consensual pedophilia. Consensual. I am a pedo. But that's not illegal as long as you don't actually do any children. So as you can imagine, some conservatives decided to come into the thread and harass him for expressing himself. But Nick held his own. He told them it was extremely ageist to not want to have sex with children. And in response to somebody saying, would you really fuck a child? Yes, if the children are okay with it. But don't think that means he molested anybody. He didn't. He vehemently denies that. Sons of bitches, I made the molesting thing up. Why do you not get this? I mean, duh. Just because the man expresses that he is a pedophile and made a statement to somebody he was in love with that he likes to molest children, and that he in fact did molest children, doesn't mean he actually molested anybody. Get it through your fucking head, conservatards. But it isn't just the Chantard trolls or Anna the Heartbreaker or even his conservative parents that are keeping him down. There's somebody else. Somebody else who's out to trip him up. The seven and a half year old half sister, Amber. You can see how hard Nick tried to fend her off, but she wouldn't leave him alone. My seven year old half sister is masturbating in front of me. Um, should I be concerned? Why does my half sister constantly smell like human feces? Okay, Amber, stop asking me to kiss you on the lips. You're my half-sister, and you're not even hot, and I think it might be illegal, too. Uh, Amber keeps asking to fillet me and other sexual things. I decline, obviously, but, like, she's making me feel uncomfortable and dirty. Using reverse psychology to get Amber to do stupid stuff, fun. Stop touching my penis, Amber. Wait a minute. What? Nah, nah, sorry. Got lost in thought there. I'm seeing something that obviously isn't there. And of course, Amber is out to get him in as much trouble as possible. Also, apparently Steve found an erotica I wrote on Amber's laptop. And now I'm not allowed at Mom's house or near Amber anymore. You know, I think, I think Nick sums it up best. How are pedophilia and corpophilia any more creepy than any other fetishes? So with all these forces aligned against him, what is Nick to do? A corrupt police force and judicial system? Conservative parents? 
Chantar Trolls, Anna the Heartbreaker, and maybe maybe the worst of all would be the preteen temptress Amber herself, all trying to bring him down a notch. How is Nick going to defend himself? He even expressed his own confusion over this. I wonder if my half-sister actually believes I did it, or if she's just lying. Maybe she had a dream or hallucination she thought was real. Dude, what? No, my half-sister herself is accusing me of molesting her. Obviously, I didn't, but I have no idea who to defend myself here. But Nick's not completely down and out yet. He has come up with perhaps the most brilliant legal strategy that has ever been thought of by a defendant in the United States of America. And in fact, you can see the seeds of this great idea taking form on Twitter earlier this month. Continued. Sexual assault, so why would I do it? My corpophilia proves I lied in the chat log. I don't receive analingus, etc. He is setting up the bulwark, the, the latest, the foundation for what is going to be his brilliant legal maneuver. And in fact, he gave us a preview of what that's going to be. A piece of evidence that once the jury sees it, is going to set him free. And I'd like to share that with you right now. But there are some issues. YouTube isn't going to let me play this video as it is. I'm going to have to only give you the audio. Now, I will do my best to commentate what is visually happening on screen so you can follow along. If you want to see the full video, I will link to a thread that has the WebM of it, and you can go and watch this real-life Perry Mason, this Phoenix Wright, put together a defense that is just stunning. And the video seems to be starting with hey, a Yeti somehow filming Steph itself with a camcorder. That's a remarkable Nate. feat. I'm not sure why it's starting um, like that, but I'm not the genius attorney. Because I've been accused of sexually assaulting my sister, and this is uh, me trying to prove that I didn't. Um, part of the reason that I think uh, they think I did it is because of this chat log... Uh, this would be the chat log we just read with Anna, the heartbreaker. I told my friend that I did uh, molest my sister. Um, and even though I've came out multiple times to say that this was a lie and that I actually didn't, uh, they nobody believes me. But, the Yeti appears um, to be slightly confused, uh, spinning the camera around a little bit. One thing um, that I can prove was definitely a lie in the chat log is that um, I mentioned in it that uh, I didn't do anal with her because uh, she had feces in her butt and um, everybody knows that I'm a coprophiliac so this wouldn't have stopped me if I were to molest somebody I definitely would have done anal no matter what and I can prove that I'm a coprophiliac because here is my toilet. He's pointing his camera into a toilet that is filled with shit. Um, and I'm going to touch the feces and masturbate with it. So, um, I don't know how to set up. He's now set the camera down with an angle at the toilet as he stands over it. As you can see, or actually I guess I should use this hand. My hand is clean right now. But it won't be in a minute. Okay, nothing on it. The Eddie is now dipping its paw into the toilet to retrieve the fecal matter. And now I am holding feces. Can you see it? Oh crap, it's falling on the floor. It seems to be having some issues. Poop is slippery. Okay, so... The Eddie is now waving the shit in its hand to get the water off of it. I'm undoing my pants. It's hard to do this one-handed, though. The Yeti is now attempting to take its cargo oh. pants off. Confusing as to why it's wearing pants, but nonetheless. The Yeti is using one paw to unzip its pants, while the other grips tightly on the fecal matter it pulled out of the toilet. The Yeti is now sitting on the toilet, exposing its naked genitals at the camera, and seems to have an incredibly small penis. If you imagine two Tic Tacs lined up end-to-end, -end, and then the person that put them on the table got hungry and ate one of the Tic Tacs. That's pretty much what you're looking at. It's a single Tic Tac. So, now it's all over my penis. I don't know if you can see it. At this point, I'm unsure if the Yeti means his penis or the poop. Um, it was requested that I film myself actually masturbating, but I'm not really... Uh, I'm not really aroused right now too much. 
Um, ever since I started on my medication, uh, my in Vegas Astena, I haven't been able to masturbate like on command. So the Yeti appears to be sad. Yeah, but um, anyway, hopefully this is proof enough that I'm a copophiliac, and that proves that I couldn't have uh, molested my sister because of, uh, you know. Case closed. Because, you know, smearing shit all over my genitals clearly indicates that I'm incapable of molesting children. That is a slam dunk. So I say to you, the viewer, what do you think? We have Nick Bates, a man who has openly expressed on the internet that he is in fact a pedophile, who has openly admitted that he's had sexual conversations with his half-sister, who was a preteen at the time, who admitted to a woman he was in love with that he had engaged in sexual activities with that minor. He's written songs, expressing his desire to rape and have sex with children. I think when you add all these things up, it's pretty clear that he is... guilty? You know what, fuck it. Free hat, McCullough. The CIA niggers glow in the dark. You can see them if you're driving. You just run them over. That's what you do. Fucking CIA niggers. Were you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm loco? I'm <laughs> Terry A. Davis is the creator of Temple OS, that's Temple Operating System, an operating system dedicated to the worship of the Lord. This is Temple OS, it's a 64-bit PC operating system. It has an oracle, that's why it's called Temple OS. Um, the main purpose is for doing offerings and of uh, hymns and art and poems and stuff, and then getting a response from God in the oracle. In fact, it's not just dedicated to him, it was specified by him. That's right, Temple OS is the only operating system that God has ever helped develop. Remember the Holy Covenant. 640 by 480. God said 640 by 480, 16 color is a, is a covenant like circumcision. And God is a real stickler. Davis even has a Q&A with the Lord on his website where he outlines exactly what he wants. Operating system? Was about to make line number column an editor. God nixed it. Was about to do different graphics mode when I found 800 by 600 missing. God said just one mode, 640 by 480. I was about to add child windows. God said, God is not the author of such confusion. I asked for verification of 640 by 480, 16 colors. God said it was because of his children and their offerings. I asked about sound. God said, single voice. I asked for verification of not having different drivers. God confirmed this. Now, outside of the development aid from Yahweh himself, Davis spent a decade, an entire decade building this, all on his own, from scratch. Using Holy C, a variant of C, Davis programmed everything. And I do mean everything. I made everything. I made a fucking editor. I made a compiler. I made a kernel. I made grep. I made uh, merge check. I made uh, convert to HTML. I made, I, made, I made everything. I made a graphics library. I made a line draw. I did it all from scratch. And with all that hard work and dedication, you can see that Davis was able to create something that can do some spectacular divinely inspired things. I like elephants and God likes elephants. Here's a, uh, a realistic elephant. That elephant is holy. Blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. So who is this man of mystery? Well, there was an actual write-up about him back in 2014 on Motherboard that outlines a bit of his history, but I think it's helpful. I think it's a good place to start before we really dive into this to give you an idea of who he is and why he spent so much time working on this project and what it is exactly that he ended up creating. Sometime during the mid-90s, Davis began to notice people were following him. He wasn't sure exactly why they were doing it, but it made him paranoid. So paranoid that he got into his car and just started driving. He didn't even know where he was going to go. Luckily, the voices on the radio told him. They said, Davis, you need to go south. You need to go to Texas. 
Upon arriving at his new destination, Davis took his car apart, searching for tracking devices which might be hidden on it, threw his keys into the desert, and began to walk away. Now it just so happened a little while later, a police officer happened to be driving by and saw him, put him into a squad car, and was going to drive him into the city. Davis, however, had other things in mind. When he jumped out of the moving squad car and broke his collarbone on the highway, now finding himself in a hospital, Davis overheard the doctors talking about x-ray results, which he was convinced were actually referring to hidden alien artifacts in his chest. He decided the best course of action was to get the fuck out of there, running out of the hospital with a broken collarbone and trying to steal a truck that was idling nearby. This would inevitably lead to his incarceration. But Davis still wasn't done yet. There's a reason they call him the MacGyver of the tech industry. Breaking his glasses on the floor, he took the frames and stuck them into an electrical outlet, hoping to free himself by switching a breaker. Didn't work out exactly as planned. Also, he was naked. Because that's exactly how you want to greet the police when they come running into your cell. Completely buck-ass naked. It was after this minor incident that Davis ended up moving back in with his parents and spent the next decade, the next 10 years, developing Temple OS because he wanted to speak to the Lord. Now I want you to try to imagine something. Think of a Bill Gates, a Steve Jobs, a Richard Stallman, a Linus Torvald, a Steve Wozniak. I want you to envision them. Just one day, all of a sudden, stripping off all their clothes and jumping out a window, screaming about glow-in-the-dark CIA niggers and how they're coming to get them. How do you think people would react? What do you think the reaction to their legacies would be? Would people take pity on them? Would they separate the man from the accomplishment? Or would the sideshow overwhelm whatever legacy they had left behind? Now, I want you to imagine that same scenario, where those people, those pioneers in their industry, hadn't actually reached the fame or recognition they deserved. That is Terry A. Davis. A man who had a psychotic break, a talented man, but who encountered mental illness so severe that any legacy he has will be overshadowed by the sideshow that he has become. Because that is what we're looking at. I'm going to show you the sideshow. And afterwards, I want you to see if you can separate that from Temple OS itself. The first thing you're going to notice right off the bat is Terry has no filter. Zero filter. It does not exist when it comes to Terry and what's on Terry's mind. It's like that South Park episode with Cartman where he fakes having Tourette's and then actually gets it later on. Just, just compare the two. The show... And my cousin and I touched Wiener, we, Wiener, Wien, Wiener, Wiener, is a cold time of year. I went my bath. Terry. There was the case where my brother, uh, Danny's like, got me high on gas. We sucked each other's dicks. It's nearly identical, and that mentality carries itself over into every single interaction that Terry A. Davis has on every single social media platform that he inhabits. It's even on his main website. The website that you go to to download the operating system, if you look at the blog on the website, you're greeted with this. I live in a CIA prison. A nigger runs my prison. In prison, the nigger tries to torment me. We can take away his knives by confessing every day. In about 2000, I masturbated fantasizing about my niece, Lainey. She looks like Star Trek 7 of 9. In 1985, at my sister's wedding, I stuck my crotch on the hot tub drain because it kind of sucked. In 1985, I tried to get a dog to lick my dick. From 1998 to 2003, I fantasized about leading a Catholic army like Dune of Mexicans or Brazilians. That was dumb because they're niggers. In 2003, I played tag with a black girl about seven years old. She reached for my crotch. In high school, in the library, Carlos and I said juicy or toxic as a way of evaluating girls. In 1988, I cheated on my SAT by talking in the hall during the break. Two problems. On 9-9-1999, I killed a CIA nigger on purpose with my car. In 1982, when I was 12, I babysat Kevin's kids. I changed a diaper because I thought that was being professional. In 1975, when I was about age 5, my brother Keith put my penis in a vacuum. In 1977, when I was about age 7, my brother Danny got me high on gas fumes and we sucked each other's dicks. Dr. Tasilisk had an oddly round ass. Paul Keck at Zytec had an oddly round ass distracting? At around age five, Jay Weinrich and I touched each other's assholes. <laughs> At about age five, Jay Weinrich and I touched dicks to each other's assholes. Just fantastic. Could you, 
Could you imagine going to the Windows Store or to an Apple website and just in the About Me section or the FAQ section, just stumbling across something of that of that magnitude, just waiting for you before you download the official version of whatever you're getting? It gives some real insight into what you're dealing with and the language that gets used and the uh, the thought processes behind them. Now, I'm sure you've picked up on a few things. He loves the word nigger, and he hates the CIA, and he also really, really hates incompetent people when it comes to technology. If you don't know what you're doing, or if you ask him a dumb question, he's going to be very upfront with you about what a dumb nigger faggot you are. Okay, listen, little faggot. Have you ever written a compiler? Have you ever written an interrupt routine, you little faggot? Have you ever written an interrupt routine, you little faggot? No, you haven't, because you're a faggot, okay? Why don't you go write an interrupt routine, faggot? Pascal, you're fucking in the ocean with some nigger in the deep ocean. You got no clue what's underneath you, you little faggot. Do you know how many people can boot it? It's because you're trying to use box, you retard nigger. You're trying to load the kernel by yourself. Do it like a white man. A white man uses an ISO file. This is the way a white operating system is installed. So if you're laughing because I got two gig for my code, you're a nigger. Temple OS is single address map. It doesn't use paging. For an average MIT nigger, they cannot understand. They, they have their minds crunched into a narrow blinder by the CIA. Goddamn Central Intelligence Agency doesn't know when to back off, but Terry's on to him. He is not falling for their tricks. He has his eyes wide open. He knows what the score is. Yeah, you know, CIA. It, definitely it's CIA. There's no question the CIA is involved here. And they're trying to get me to get back to work. They're trying to use her to get me to go back to work. And, you know, I don't have this. My heart, you know, like, you know, it, it hurt when she's fucking that nigger. Now it's like, fuck, I can swap a girlfriend. Would be no fucking big deal. And he knows how to deal with them. Like he said earlier, you hit those glow-in-the-dark motherfuckers with your car. The CIA niggers glow in the dark. You can see them if you're driving. You just run them over. And Terry's not afraid to say so publicly. He'll tell them right to their goddamn face. When I am king by divine right, I will hunt down every CIA nigger and execute him personally. I killed a CIA nigger by running him over on 9999. I was being followed by agents and freaked out. It's okay to run over space aliens. If you see a CIA nigger, run them over. They glow in the dark. Plan B? I'm not sucking CIA nigger cock, bitch. Fuck yourself. <laughs> I have a space alien. Plan B? Fuck you. And why is Terry so adamant? Why does he hate the CIA in particular? Why not the FBI or the NSA or any other intelligence agency in the United States? What about the CIA particularly? Does he dislike? Homo is a choice. I was normal until the CIA started torturing me with pedophile bait. CIA is atheist retard niggers. Everything backfires. Pedophile bait? What does he mean by that? How was the CIA torturing him with pedophile bait? The CIA has a seven-year-old deep-throating a loaded forty-five at the DMV next to me, fucking with me. I'll teach him to pull the trigger. FBI put kid next to me in DMV to invoke a sex response. I said I would put a gun in his mouth. <laughs> When FBI child sex agents got in my space, I wanted to stick a gun and kill one. Shove a pencil in the eye of another and toss into traffic. If your personal space is violated by someone's child, FBI agent, and they act horny, you might want to panic and wonder have a child sex response. Clearly, the American government is using field agents who are actually preteen children to arouse him and turn him into a pedophile. Luckily, he knows to stick a gun in their mouth to make them go away. And it's not just the child agents of the government that Terry will stand up to in person. He'll stand up to those CIA niggers in public, too. I think... Hey, nigger. How you doing? In fact, I think the only things that Terry hates more then child sex operatives of the government and those goddamn CIA niggers would be birds that don't know when to stop shitting. They have to be dealt with harshly. 
in Terry's world. I fucking killed the bird, didn't I? I fucking took that piece of shit bird, fucking smashed its head. Fucking, here I am living in shit from the goddamn bird for how many years? Fucking little piece of shit bird doing its mating call, and I'm fucking annoyed as fuck. Little pussy bird fucking living with that thing shitting on me, making my room shit. Fucking took that thing, fucking smashed its head. Fucking no more bird holding me under. Fuck yeah, man. Fucking liberated from the goddamn bird, you know? Sad, I know, but occasionally to make an omelet, you've got to break some eggs, or in this case, kill the bird by throwing it against the wall. I can't say if this is an actual true story on Terry's part, because that's one of the problems you encounter when you're dealing with somebody who's completely insane. Are they telling the truth? And they don't have a filter when they're, when they're telling you things that no normal person would ever openly admit? Or are the voices in their head compelling them to say things that are just untrue to begin with? However, whether he's insane or not, there is one nugget of truth that he has seemingly clawed onto, which I think we can all agree with. Bill Gates and the Illuminati got a herd of nigger cattle. Woo! We got a herd of nigger cattle! We got a herd of nigger cattle! They got a big herd of nigger cattle. yippee ki -yay. We're nigger cattle herders. We got a herd of nigger cattle. They are the most docile fucking nigger cattle. We got them so docile. We got this awesome big fucking herd of nigger cattle. And they shit. Somebody needs to address the issue of Bill Gates and his nigger cattle herd. I know Terry, is, he's broached the subject, but it's time for brave developers and programmers to come forward and talk about this issue. Bill Gates and his nigger cattle herd cannot be allowed to roam freely anymore. This is a problem. Now, what you've just witnessed is the sideshow of Terry A. Davis, and it is equal in portion to the accomplishment of Temple OS. So how do you separate the two? When you have somebody who seemingly has a gift or an ability or a technical skill who could really do things and create things because before he went crazy, before he had his psychotic break, he was working with companies like Ticketmaster and others. He was, he was starting to dip his toes into the professional pool and where that may have led, we'll, we'll never know. What we're left with is a 10 year long legacy, the aftermath of a psychotic break from the mind of a schizophrenic who wanted to develop an uh, operating system to talk to God now, I've laughed a lot. Some of this shit is the funniest stuff I've ever read, and some of Davis's live streams will make you laugh like you wouldn't believe. I know it's sad to admit, people don't like to admit it, especially when it comes to a real legitimate mental illness, but he, I, I would be dishonest if I did not admit that I find this pretty fucking funny. It's sad, though, to see that whatever ability he had, whatever chance he had at a career and a future, it's gone. How, how do you recover from this? How is he ever going to be taken seriously? Who's going to work with him? Who's going to say, that's my coworker, that's the guy that uh, I'm building something new with, something innovative with? But I think the one thing that Davis really highlights, at least for me, and this is touching all the way back on Tumblrisms, when I used to, uh, when I used to do that, the, the, one of the first episodes, uh, Headmates, is that real mental illness fucks your life up. Davis lives with his parents. His, his professional opportunities are limited. And he will always have the stigma and he will never be able to really interact with anybody in a social manner comfortably for the rest of his life. Compared to the Tumblrettes, the SJWs, the Snowflakes, they like to invent mental illnesses. They like to make up buzzwords to get attention. Real mental illness, as funny as it may be to watch, will fuck you into the dirt. And it's not a way to garner attention. And Davis really shows that. He lays it bare. It's, it's for you to go look at. You can look at what he tried to build, and you can look at who he is, and you can look at the impact schizophrenia has had on his life. It's a sad but true statement. And there, but for the grace of God, go I. President Obama and citizens of the world, we are TIs, targeted individuals, and law-abiding citizens being targeted every day of our lives. Were you trying to get crazy with this thing? Don't you know I'm local? You hear me? I'm not insane! This is not reality! Not reality! Not reality! This is reality. Thanks a lot, Obama. I'm not sure if the president ever got around to addressing this dire situation of these individuals being targeted before he left the Oval Office. Not sure if that was high up on Barack's priority list. Of course, you know what they say. 
you can't rely on the government for everything. And so what better way to find a solution than by bringing it to the people themselves, such as this Kickstarter. I am a targeted individual. Now, sadly, it, uh, it fell a little short of its uh, desired goal of $14,000. Only raised 11. I'm not sure if that's 11 individuals that were targeted individually donating a dollar each, or if it's one individual donating all $11, because they're just that fucking committed. But imagine my surprise when I recognized a familiar face in the pitch video. Hello, my name is Brian Connors. I live in Pittsburgh, and I'm constantly being harassed. Brian Connors. Holy shit. When I initially started this series, Internet Insanity, he was the very first episode. He was a pilot who had his whole life in front of him. Sadly, mental illness got the best of him. Mental illness that was egged on by a certain online community feeding into his paranoia and delusions. Strikingly, Terry A. Davis dealt with the exact same thing to a certain extent. He touched on it slightly in the motherboard interview that I brought up when I was talking about him in that particular episode. Both these individuals, both highly talented individuals who fell victim to a mental illness, seem to have this component, this community kind of ingrained into their paranoia and delusion. And that community would be gang stalking. Now, gang stalking has existed on YouTube for quite a while. There's a dedicated community to it. There are channels which archive and document and talk about it. But what was really surprising to me was just how much growth has been in that community, how much it's really taken off and spread. Even from when I had done the Brian Connors video, which was just a few years ago, it seems to have gained quite a bit of steam. It seems to have grown more than I would have expected. And the thing about this particular community and this particular subject is once a vulnerable individual gets hooked on it, it's almost impossible for them to get out. They they become wholly consumed by the idea, and then you see a dramatic shift in what they used to talk about, and it becomes focused exclusively on gang stalking. For example, this particular channel, you'll see their post history, their upload history, dealt mostly with religious music. But then one year ago, there was a dramatic shift in the content they were putting up. It was no longer religious music, it was entirely dedicated to the concept of gang stalking. And not just videos discussing the subject, but being a victim of it, being a targeted individual. You can actually see the effect of this this concept, this community playing itself out on this particular person. You have videos of them simply filming people doing their day-to-day -day routine and ascribing to that malicious intent. This particular video is seven minutes long, and all it is is this individual filming a woman sitting across from her on the bus. But when you read the description, you suddenly realize you are smack dab in the middle of crazy town. They bring up the point that the people sitting across from them are talking about rape in an effort to get this person to live on the street or go to a shelter. And that's not a one-off. This account has multiple videos where they just film random people who don't interact or even talk to them. And it always has something to do with gang stalking. Those people are out to get them. They're what the gang stalking community calls perps. Perpetrators, individuals that are working with an organization or the government or whatever entity they believe is responsible for this and is targeting them specifically to ruin their lives or drive them insane. And that's an idea that this individual, that people in this community truly believe. Just look at this video title, Gang Stalking. I was drugged and gang raped. This guy here actually told me I raped you too. This guy, whose name is Greg, stalked me to this particular location. This occurred on 2216. He told me that he was one of the men that raped me last year too. I was drugged and gang raped. Well, that sounds pretty intense. You would expect that this would be a massive video. Why didn't this go viral? This man admitted that he drugged and gang raped this woman and she has it on film. Well, let's look at the video. It's 30 seconds long and see if you can pick out the point when this man, Greg, tells this person that he gang raped her and drugged her last year. Today is February the 2nd, 2016. Time now is 6.55 p.m. He's, he's nuts. Absolutely nuts. I want to sign out now. Oh yes, he's nuts. Clearly Greg is the person here that's mentally unstable. Even though at no point in that 30 second clip did he ever admit to drugging or gang raping this person. 
But yes, it's Greg that's the one with the issue. Greg is the person that needed to be filmed for that remarkable confession that only exists in this person's head. And that is symptomatic of the people that believe in this concept of gang stalking. Every single incidental or non-consequential thing, every action an individual around them takes, suddenly has a deeper meaning. It's part of the grand conspiracy, this nefarious plan which exists out in the ether to destroy them. And so when you have a person that's right on the edge, right on the precipice of mental illness, that's one step away from real insanity, and they come across this material, they come across this community that exists on YouTube and elsewhere. It's that final push, it's what's needed to throw them completely off into the deep end. And one of the interesting aspects of this are the common elements that you'll see play themselves out time and time again across each of these accounts. And so I'm going to walk you through some of that. I'm going to introduce you to gang stalking and just how insane it is. So how do you know you're dealing with perpetrators? How do you know you're surrounded by gang stalkers? Well, the first clear, distinct sign that you're being gang stalked would be the hand signals. If you see these hand signs more than enough times a day, know you're being gang stalked. And I'll show you a few of them. Okay. One is here. Two. Oh, that's right. They use sign language. Pantomiming. They're like a sports coach that's walking the streets trying to get everybody to huddle up and come after you. And what are some of those detailed gestures they might actually do that could possibly tip you off to the fact that they're out there to get you? When they're signaling, they're revealing to whoever else is surveilling you or the other gang stalkers in the area your exact location. If they're brushing their hair to one side, it's the side that's closest to me. That's totally Masonic. It's an arch right there. So if someone's doing that, that's a that's like a Freemason thing. And uh, females, they they love the hair thing. They're gonna flick their hair on whatever side of their head is closest to where I am. Now a sane individual would listen to somebody say something like that and come to the conclusion that this person is misinterpreting basic behaviors that people engage in on the street. If you have an itchy nose, you scratch it. If your hair's must up, you fix it. Uh, you maybe hold your arms in a certain way, or you take a certain position because you're uncomfortable around others. Usually when people cross their arms in a crowded area, it's a defensive mechanism because they're not really extroverted. But those small bits of psychology are cast away. They're cast away for the greater conspiracy of gang stalking. And this is information they feed each other. So imagine that you come across this community and you're maybe slightly mentally ill or you're a little off kilter and these people start telling you, hey, if you see somebody scratch their nose, that means a handler. A handler, by the way, is somebody that controls the perps. The perps are the people that work for the organization to come get you. So if somebody scratches their nose, that must be a handler. And he's got perps working with him that are coming to get you. So you need to be clued into that body language to know that you're in danger. One of the other things to keep an eye out for are vehicles. Now, a common thing you're going to come across if you look into gang stalking, especially on a video website, are the sheer amount of accounts that have video after video dedicated to filming automobiles. Now these videos run the gambit from people sitting in a parking lot and just filming random individuals in their car thinking that this is some evidence that they're being gang stalked. Yeah, see that's what's funny. They don't like it when being exposed. Put them right on YouTube, right on blast. Watch them all scurry. Give them all run. Look at that shit. Uh, that's gang stalking. To people actually hiding behind buildings and filming empty and deserted parking lots, waiting for somebody to drive by so they can say that person's a gang stalker. They would have to expose themselves if I decided to and was determined to sit here for a little while. They would eventually drive by. But the craziest bit out of all of the vehicle related videos is the common idea that red is a giveaway. Two red ones here, red one there, red one there, red one next to it, and a red one in front of it. So we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six that uh, got here after us. You will come across video after video talking about red automobiles and how that is direct evidence that you were being hunted. Stepped outside and already got three of them. Very consistent with 
what I've been telling you guys I get game stocks with. The red and white. Check it out. Another red one. Red one's driving around up front there. <clears throat> this is what I get. And some of the explanations for why the color red is chosen make even less sense than you could possibly imagine. We see that there's a red car parked at the end, and that also is a gang stalking pattern. Gang stalking, the core of it is anchoring. It's a neurolinguistic programming technique, which firemen learned when they, so many of them took neurolinguistic programming workshops. I don't know about you, but as a taxpayer, I'm not sure if I want to fund firefighters going on government PSYOP expeditions to screw with the basic citizenry. And so once again, just like the misinterpretation of behavior out in public is some signaling to other people to stalk someone, we now have people spreading information that if you see a car that's painted a certain color or is driving around a parking lot for whatever reason, that that must mean somebody's after you. And you notice this car is backed up so far over the curb you can barely walk on the sidewalk. That's something they like to do too. So you have two things now that are screwing with your head. Now that you've been introduced to this community, you're watching people around you, you begin to film them. You become sucked into this paranoia, into this delusion. You want to get it on tape. You want to confront people about it. And they do go out and confront people. They walk up to random people on the streets and accuse them of gang stalking them. Stop stalking me, right? Don't ever stalk me again. Are you talking to me? Yeah. About what? Don't ever stalk me again. Who's stalking you about you. what? You. <laughs> Stop some more. Do it. <laughs> You're crazy. Is that right? Yes, it is. Excuse me, ma'am. How much did they pay you to gang stalk me? I'm not gang stalking you. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. I see. This old fake ass bullshit. You notice she come out with the red, this old fake ass American shit. <coughs> Gang stalking ass motherfuckers. <coughs> terrorist, you're a terrorist. Uh, excuse me, sir. Um, like I know that you're a handler, and pretty much everybody else on YouTube, they know that you're a handler. We're wondering why you're out here killing people, man. The signals that you give people to come harass me. What do you got to say? Yeah. You know what, bro? I don't know what your problem is, but... You know what? I'm just trying to figure out how much you get paid to be a stalker, bro. <laughs> get out of here, buddy. Seriously. Get out of here. <laughs> you are connected to the Multnomah County Sheriff's and the Portland Police Department. You're a fucking murderer. You're trying to cover Officer Eric Carlson's ass. You're a goddamn murderer. You're a fucking poisoner. Sting up. And all of these confrontations are brought about by misinformation put up on YouTube by other deluded people that got sucked into this too. And so as the individual gets more and more engrossed in this, as they get more and more sucked into this fantasy, into this absolute insane idea that they're being gang stalked by people in the community, they begin to try to explain exactly what's behind it and to monitor its effects on them. Okay, activity's definitely escalated here. Um, get back here and turn on the meter and lower and behold, wow, my head's hot. Um, I can feel the, the feelings of nausea. Um, start having the, the kind of red spots, you know, just feeling itchy on the skin and whatnot. And lo and behold, uh, mind you, the exact same setup on everything. Here's the speaker wire. Uh, it's coming in here. It's just sitting here. Well, that looks like a scientific experiment to me. Let's hook that up to the fucking blinds. Or better yet, let's discuss the fact that every human being on Earth is covered in fungus. And that's what the gang stalkers want. It also doesn't matter if your body itself is already the antenna. And it's not from a chip, it's not from any of that. There's something on you that you can't see. 100% of you have a fungal infection on your skin and in your body. But oh wait, maybe it's not fungus after all. Maybe they're implanting microchips into you. When you become a targeted individual, like a victim of electronic harassment, so you need to think, did I go to the dentist? Did I have, you know, dental surgeries? Did I have a flu jab? Did I have any operations? Anything like that? Because 
that is where you could have been, you know, implanted with a chip. Don't go to the dentist. Don't go to the doctor. They're implanting things. And better yet, throw out your television because it gives you nightmares that shock you. I don't know if they use TVs and stuff, but I think they do. Because, like, the nights that I forget to unplug it and sleep with it on, I have, like, these really weird dreams of being shocked, like shocked so bad that I drop my phone in the place I'm walking in. But what do I know? Other people are the experts on this subject, like this guy. I'm gonna lay it to you straight, man, about that gang stalking stuff. It's not really the right term to use for it because you're not being stalked. You're being harassed. I'm sure you're probably wondering how do I know these things? Because I do. I mean, fuck it, man. He just knows because he knows. You need to back the fuck off and listen to the expert because he do and you don't. And so when you look at the sum of it all, what's the conclusion that you come to? Well, you have a group of individuals that are obviously mentally ill, feeding misinformation to other mentally ill people, creating this weird feedback loop where their paranoia and their delusion keeps getting worse and worse and worse. You can see this play itself out in people like Brian Connors or even Terry Davis. Suddenly, everybody is out to get them. Every car that's parked at a weird angle, every time somebody itches their nose, is all part of the conspiracy that's been created around their life. And perhaps the strangest part about all of this is that the people that believe they're being gang stalked end up behaving like the gang stalkers they think exist. They're the ones running around with a cell phone camera filming people in public. They surveil them. They tail them and confront them. They're doing exactly what they think is being done to them. In the end, I think the simplest way to put it is the belief in gang stalking does more damage than actual gang stalking. The notion that this monster exists is scarier than the reality of that monster actually existing. It is the idea of gang stalking that is destroying these people. But with all this um, gang stalking stuff going on, it's just, like most people say, it runs their life. And it's like literally running my life. Shut the fuck up! You shove cucumbers down your pussy! Shut the fuck up! I said you shove cucumbers down your pussy! Shut the fuck up! Were you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm local? I want you to picture the protagonist from Hatred. Dark, brooding, angsty, ready to unsheath his katana at a moment's notice. Now take that image, that personification of rage incarnate, and put him in a pretty dress. Because deep down, he wants to be a little girl. Add on top of that the fact that he is a huge fan of My Little Pony. There he stands before you, with shotgun in hand, in his pretty high heels and his MLP hat ready to enact his plan. And what's his master plan? That if he kills enough people, if he murders enough people before killing himself, he will be reincarnated as a second string character from a Nickelodeon cartoon show. But our angsty, transsexual brony, who is a huge Nickelodeon fan, isn't a work of fiction. He's Randy Stairs, otherwise known online as Andrew Blaze because it was this bizarre amalgamation of a person, this motivation behind an act, that drove Randy to kill three co-workers at the supermarket he worked at, all to attain his goal of becoming a ghost girl in the hereafter. Now, a lot of times when you examine insane people, when you look at the aftermath of an act of violence, there are two things people want to know, the what and the why. Why did they do it? What was the motivation for them doing it? Why was no one there to stop them? What could have prevented this tragedy from happening? But myself, I'm more interested in the when and the how. How did the transformation begin? How did Randy Stairs, somebody who started out on YouTube a decade ago, go from a normal kid to a sociopathic Nickelodeon spree killer? When exactly? 
did he go from normal to batshit insane? One of the major differences between what happened with Randy Stairs and something like a Columbine is the amount of evidence left behind. While it's true that spree killers and mass killers in the past have left behind manifestos, as Randy has, what's different now is that people catalog, they archive their entire life online. And so in the case of Randy Stairs, we have a decade's worth of a history of a footprint of who he was and when this transformation began. So I'm going to take us on a journey. I'm going to show you Randy Stairs' descent into pure insanity. Randy Stairs, before he was known online as Andrew Blaze, before he was part of the EGS, the Ghost Squad Spree Killing Nickelodeon Fan Club, was known as Pioneer Productions. Now, Pioneer Productions was a holy fucking shit, what the fuck. Let me make something crystal clear. I don't like Danny Phantom. I'm a Dexter's Lab sort of guy. And as we all know, Cartoon Network fans only commit robberies. I'll pull off a diamond heist, but I'm not going to kill my co-workers because I want to become a transsexual ghost girl. That's just retarded. Now, Pioneer Productions existed since 2008, and one of the first things you're going to notice about the channel, about the content that Randy produces, is that it is completely nondescript. It blends into the crowd. There is nothing unique or surprising about it. In the entirety of the eight years that the channel was up and running, he tried everything and anything to get noticed. It is the quintessential YouTube channel, throwing as much shit at the wall, hoping something sticks so you'll find popularity. One of the earliest and best examples of this would be Mr. Horsehead meets Mr. Wooden Alligator. This is from the heyday of YouTube, where you could make incredibly shitty content, and people would gobble it up, which just sounds like a fucking hoot and a holler to watch. Now, interestingly, this is the most popular video on his channel. That's excluding an upload of a music video that was pulled down due to DMCA. Legally speaking, this is the most popular video he ever produced. And the only reason it has any popularity to it is because he got some heat. He got noticed by having a crossover with a much more popular YouTuber at the time. While Make Me Bad 35 has gone the route of Fred nowadays, where nobody really knows who the fuck he is and his videos get barely any views, back in the day he got quite a few. So this was a coup for Randy. And once he got a taste of success, he tried over and over to repeat it by copying the format and trying again and again with whales and frogs and any other kind of children's toy to become as popular as Make Me Bad was. However, for Randy, that never materialized. The videos never garnered many views. And so it was back to the drawing board again. If at first you don't succeed, try fucking anything to get noticed. Another attempt that Pioneer Productions was a part of was again a crossover. This was a channel filmed with his brother and their friends that emulated Jackass, where they'd go out and do stunts to try to garner views. Much like his toy videos, it never really went anywhere. Even when he got a gig making a music video for a band in the local area, he still didn't really get the attention that he was seeking. And this is a common theme played out time and time again on his channel. Over the course of eight years, he could never find something that really attracted an audience. At his peak, even he says that he was always stuck between 8,500 to 9,000 subs. If you've been on YouTube for nearly a decade, that's about 1,000 subs a year, much less than he was hoping for, much less than Make Me Bad 35 had, which was around 1.9 million. And this lack of an audience becomes very visible when you watch the live streams that he engaged in, where he would sit for three hours and talk to no one, all by himself, desperately trying to get somebody to connect to, Between 2011 and 2013, both on YouTube and on other streaming websites, Randy repeatedly attempted to try to be a streamer, and yet never found success. It becomes a common theme with him over and over again. Even when emulating something that's popular, even when riding on a trend, trying to capitalize on something that somebody found success in, Randy is an abject failure time and time again. 
and after years of this, you can begin to see the cracks start to show. He starts to release content that becomes much more depressed, much more withdrawn, darker than what he usually did, where he talks about how he's disillusioned with YouTube, where the creative outlet that he enjoyed so much for so many years no longer fills the niche, no longer captures his attention. I'm tired of living in the shadow of other YouTubers, and I'm sick of putting so much work into videos and not getting anywhere with it. You know, I've... I've said that about the gaming channel too, but I've put so much time into my videos and I've just been stuck the last three years in pretty much the same ballpark range of subscribers. It's just always been between, you know, 8,900 to, to 9,000. And uh, it's just not fun anymore. YouTube was the funnest thing I had in my life. I wanted it to be my career, but that's not going to happen. Um, I just, I think it's time for me to stop. And perhaps a portent to the future, in a series of videos, he goes through and methodically kills the characters he created over the course of eight years in his videos, and introduces the new content that he is shifting towards. That new content would be E.G.S. No matter how much time passes, it can't erase the disbelief, the disgust. The pain. The EGS, or Ember's Ghost Squad, was a radical departure from the content that people who were users and subscribers of Pioneer Productions were used to. It was so radically different that Randy took it upon himself in a multitude of videos to explain to them the shift in content they were about to witness. This is a pretty big departure from what you're used to watching from me. I just want to let you know that this is like the point of no return. There is no going back after this. To Randy, this was a new, darker direction with a personal meaning behind it. To the majority of others watching, it was laughably bad flash animation. But nonetheless, Randy wholly dedicated himself to it, creating a social media network to support this entirely new entertainment property. From Instagram to wiki accounts, Facebook, and multiple Twitters, he solely dedicated his time to creating this new content, something which he deeply deeply believed in. Now honestly, I don't know where this squad idea came from. It just sort of happened. I know uh, a big part of it was the dark stuff I've had to deal with personally in my life over the last few years. Every single little bit of those dark moments just contributed to this thing and it just continued to grow inside my head. And then I decided to actually make a series out of it. But it's really more than just a YouTube video. It's, it's like, it's just, it's, I don't know. Now, a key question to ask when looking at the creation of this channel and the content that's found on it is what exactly was the inspiration for its creation? This is something that Andrew actually addressed. He talked about a one and a half month period where multiple accidents took place. He talks about two friends being injured in car accidents and then getting into a very bad car accident himself. But the ultimate trigger happened between 2012 and 2013. What happened was in February 2012, there was a kid that got killed in a car accident that I went to school with. Um, he was in his last year of high school. He was a senior. I had just graduated the previous year, but I knew him. I wasn't like good friends with him or anything, but we knew each other. And then one day I got word that he got killed on his way to school in the morning. And that event was what started this different area of production for me. And then that leads us into January of 2013, which was the ultimate demise of my mind for the most part. Because so many things happened in this little span of time that just destroyed me. It was all the bad luck that I could have had in a year thrown into one month and a half for the most part. What happened was, in January, mid-January, I went back to college to start the new semester, and I got word that uh, a kid that was in one of my classes the previous semester was killed in a car crash. Unfortunately, another event happened in the first week of February, which was a car accident that I was involved in. Long story short, I got sandwiched between two cars, totaled my car in a parking lot. Of all places, a parking lot, right? Well, that added to this madness that was going on in my head, and then that sent me into an area which I had never really been in before. It was very weird, just this place in my head where I just started to get ideas like never before. But all these events that happened to me, it just opened an area in my head that 
uh, honestly, it's been there before, ever since I was a kid, pretty much. There's just this area I would go into, but I just was always fascinated with the unknown, the afterlife, dying, death, ghosts, all this stuff that is just a distant reality from this world. I was just always fascinated by it. The EGS itself is a continuation of a children's show, Danny Phantom, centering around Ember, a character in the show, and the ghost dimension where people go after they die. Members of the Ember Ghost Squad will seek out suicidal and depressive people, cast a spell on them, and recruit them into the fold. There's a catch, though. No men allowed. Because when you join Ember's Ghost Squad, you become a female. This plays on a hidden character trait of Randy himself in real life, his transsexuality, something he was uncomfortable discussing with people he knew something he had kept hidden from his family and friends, his neighbors, and his co-workers. Now, the content itself could be classified, well, <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. I've taken some snippets of the videos that were available on the YouTube channel. It's been pulled down since. YouTube has removed it for violating terms of service due to the suicide murder tape he had put up on it. But before that happened, I was able to download a majority of the videos, and it put together a compilation to give you an idea of the kind of quality content that would be found on the EGS channel itself. Fucking nigger. Apparently ghosts don't like black people either. It's good to know the Embers Ghost Squad is a white nationalist organization. Also, that's one hell of a way to pick a fucking Super Bowl winner. I hope you all fucking die. A good majority of the video centered around these taped sessions where People who would die or commit suicide talked about seeing members of the Ember Ghost Squad moments before they died. I looked up at the clock and saw the final minutes ticking down. And then I saw it. It was in the shadows of that window glass just staring at me. <sighs> I don't understand how you could just say what through after all that I've done for you! Where's the logic in it? Emily! I would throw away science! I would throw away math! I would throw away my precious book collection! Just to have another chance! I lost. I failed. I let everybody down. all leading into a meta-narrative, into a longer video that he was going to put out that he had animators and voice actors working on, and a piece of content which he himself says helped contribute to him going on his killing spree. After decades of recruiting, it's our time to rise. <laughs> Now, as I discussed in part two, when Andrew, when Randy set up the EGS, the Ember Ghost Squad, he created a social media network around it, and part of that was creating Twitter accounts. But Randy didn't just make one Twitter account. Randy made numerous Twitter accounts. Now, if you remember in the retrospective I did on That Guy with the Glasses, I talked about how Spoonie One had a Twitter account for his dog, where he would roleplay as it and respond to himself. And as crazy as that may seem, Randy outdoes it because he set up at least five to six different accounts of characters from the EGS in which he would follow each other, favorite and like each other, retweet each other, and even have in-depth conversations with himself, talking about how much he loved himself from the perspective of each individual character. Now, the reason I bring that up is because on the night of the murders, when he went into the grocery store to kill his co-workers, he released on all these social media accounts, even the multiple Twitter accounts, 
the following messages. This info dump included a couple of things. One was a manifesto. It was written works, his journals and his thoughts over the previous year. Another was a compilation of videos of his pre-planning the crime. And we'll talk about that in part four. But the cherry on top, the real fucking winner, was the video we are about to watch. Now, I can't play all of it. It's over 20 minutes long, but I highly encourage you to go check it out because it is shithouse rat insane. It is so far off the scale of crazy, I can't do it justice trying to describe it. We're going to watch some snippets of it to give you an idea of his mental mindset going into his murder spree. You've seen the transition from the average YouTuber making any content he could to try to become popular to suddenly shifting to this obsession with a children's show where he wanted to reincarnate as a cartoon character with a ghost pussy. Now, this video was something he had been building up to. He had previously talked about how much animation he had to do just to make an opening. Um, if you haven't seen the intro yet, you should. I, I've spent about 6 to 15 months on that fucking thing to perfect it, and um, it, it costs a lot of money to make it, actually. The content on EGS I haven't really talked about yet, but few people realize that some of that stuff costs money to do. EGS, I've spent over $300 on. I'm not even kidding. Uh, over $300 went into EGS. Almost every video that goes up there could cost money. You don't realize that, and that's something I don't go into, but, you know, this is a channel that I've worked my ass off on. He had reached out to other animators, to other people that did this sort of work, to try to get their help to make the video, but they didn't deliver on time. And so you will see a jump in quality from semi-passable flash animation that you would find on Newgrounds back in 2004 to cartoon doodles that a semi-retarded child would make in kindergarten. And he is extremely angry about that because this was his coup de grace. This was his I hate the world and I'm going to kill people video. And it didn't get the production value he was going for. Just watching the opening and reading the text scrawl really helps to highlight that. He is really pissed off about it. Nothing says totally sane individual, like making out with your shotgun and then doing a music video in your bedroom. A bedroom, which I might add, is completely covered in wall-to-wall -wall posters of Danny Phantom cartoon and My Little Pony characters. I hope you all thought you died. One of the other things that the video helps to really illustrate is that Randy obviously was a very introverted person, somebody who was mocked openly for his obsession with the children's cartoon because some of the lines of dialogue, some of the bullying dialogue you hear in this is just pure comedy. Andrew's the lankiest, gayest kid in the county of Westboro! What'd you say, bitch? Shut your mouth, you goddamn whore! Hey, Andrew! I heard you like to print out girls' Facebook pics and jizz on their faces! Hold her down, grab her legs! Hey, look, there's Andrew John, his little girls again! Snip that bitch's hair off! Hey, Andrew! How big's your dick? I bet you jerk to your precious drawings because you can't get any real pussy! Hey, Rachel, how does my semen taste in your mouth? Do you even know what you want to do with your life? Rachel, you're failing math again. Why don't you ever hang out with anybody? There's a bloody tampon in her sandwich. She's probably fantasizing about my dick in his mouth. Quick, shove it down her shirt. Hey, Andrew, got any loo? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Why don't you have a boyfriend, Rachel? Shut the fuck up! Now, I want you to see if you can pinpoint the moment that this goes from semi-passable production value into finger paint mode. <laughs>
course, you have to end it with how he envisions what's going to happen after his suicide. Because once he's done killing himself, that's when he gets his ghost vagina. And again, just to reiterate, these are just a few, a few, just minor snippets of this amazing video. This pure fucking insane look into the mind of a disturbed individual. He put this up thinking it was going to wow people. This was the video he put up that was going to make a statement to the world. I don't know what the statement he imagined it was going to make was, but I know the one I interpret it as. That he was suffering from some form of fucking autism. Now, that manifesto, the information that he had posted along with this video, the journal pages, the videos leading up to the executions that he performed at his workplace, paint a very interesting picture of who this person was. This wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. This is something he methodically planned out for at least a year, training himself to use weapons, purchasing weapons, and planning on carrying this out on a specific date, a date he hints at on social media and even his wiki page. You can see the date listed clearly, Andrew Blaze Day, and on his Facebook account, which again is now deleted, but some screen caps remain. Look at the smugness of these statements. Something big is coming. Get ready for this date. He was gleeful about what he was going to do. And to really see that in its fullest context, we need to look at the manifesto information he left. To really see how much he planned this and the bizarre rationale that he left behind. <laughs> Now, in the collected tome of information that Randy left behind, there were many different documents and formats that were included. Among them was a journal. Now, I'm not going to be focusing on that for a few reasons. The main reason being that their insight and importance is secondary to the videos themselves. There's a lot more you can glean from a video than you can from writing. The behavior and mannerisms of an individual in a video, their cadence and how they carry themselves, the things they say and the way they look when they say them, gives you a better understanding of their mindset when you're trying to get the most information out of it. Now the videos included in the manifesto follow Randy as he's planning his action at the supermarket. In fact, it even predates that. He lets a coin flip decide where the massacre is going to occur. Okay, so here's the deal. Got a 1983 quarter right here. You believe in fate? Here's the fate test. I'm gonna flip this three times, or the best out of three, rather. And if it's heads, I'll do it here. If it's tails, supermarket. Once the location had been set and he was working on his video, you can still see the anger he has at the animators for not contributing to his final video meant to be amazing and yet I had to do everything which fucking animators can kiss my ass for that. Now a good majority of the film that he left behind was his use of guns. Alright so back up at the shooting range again. Uh, I just brought Mackenzie this time just for the sake of being secretive about it. And that's a detail I should probably expand upon. He named his shotguns. He named his shotguns after characters in the Ember Ghost Squad. He gave them personalities. He named them after his own OC. And along with the shotguns, he made sure to get a lot of ammunition because he wanted to practice as much as he could. <laughs> I, I can't fuck. Like, there's 250 fucking shells! 250 rounds of ammunition! What the fuck? Now, you might be curious why he would need that much. Well, if you remember the Polygon playthrough of Doom, that's basically Randy's shooting ability.
he fired 50 times in the store and only killed three people. That's averaging roughly 16 shots a person with a shotgun at close range to kill somebody. Randy was not very skilled with weaponry. Nonetheless, he was excited. He was looking forward to the murder-suicide. There's just, there's a lot that can change the date of this thing. In a way, I firmly believe it will be June 7th. Um, in reality, it'll be the 8th because it'll be past midnight, but... Um, that's what I'm thinking. It's getting to the point now where I just, I want it to be here. I just, I want to go. I'm tired of envisioning putting that barrel in my mouth and pulling the trigger, you know. Every time I look at that suicide picture of Eric Harrison telling Klebold, it's like, I just want it to be here already. It's just, it's, just, it's going to be like that. The whole thing is just going to be like that. Not just how he was going to take himself out, but the amount of power he was going to feel when he killed other people, when he held their life in his hands. My, uh... <laughs> there's going to be all kinds of thoughts racing through my head in those final few minutes, just like, like, I'm so ready. Like, there's going to be so much adrenaline flowing through me. I'm going to feel like more powerful than I ever have in my life and there's not going to be anyone that's going to be able to stop me. Now a good majority of the videos that are included in the manifesto are upwards of an hour. Some of them are just car rides where he's talking about his planning and how he's going to go about the massacre. Other times it's filmed in his room talking about the different steps he's going to take to make sure the exits are blocked and who he's going to target and what time he's going to commit the attack. But it's the last two videos of the manifesto that really give an insight into his mindset and what set all of these events into motion and the rationale behind them. It's like there's EGS recruits telling me to do it in my head. Do it. Do it. It's not schizophrenia or anything like that. But it's like there's spirits telling me in my head, do it. These last two films were dedicated to his parents, and in them he explains quite a bit. Now you have to remember, they don't know much about their son. They're probably not even really aware of his YouTube channel, so he has to go through the steps of explaining what the hell Ember's Ghost Squad is, and the significance it plays in his life. Like if you look on the poster behind me, those were inspired by Ember McLean, which is a ghost from a TV show called Danny Phantom which started back in 2003, 2004. You know, I was in late elementary school at that time. But this ghost, this woman always connected with me. Ever since I first saw her, it just, something changed. It was like a spark. And it just connected with me, it made me feel warm inside. And it felt very familiar, which was strange. It was like I'd seen her before. But at the time, it was a brand new show. And nothing had ever been done like that before with that type of character like you never saw that character anywhere else except that show and um i just grew attached to her unlike anything i ever have in my life it's just one thing i'll say is like that white stain on the floor like that splotch you'll see on my carpet that was an ember thing i just i wanted to make my skin as white as possible to look like her i wanted it to be completely white so i bought this this body paint which was like, I don't even know what it was. It was like latex shit that like, it becomes like glued to your skin and you gotta peel it off. And it got on the carpet and then it got freaking in my body hair, which like almost never came out at the time. What little body hair I had at the time anyways, but um, that stuff never came off. <laughs> it's funny. As I said, 2013, Ember came back into my life and she was never out of it again. Even further than that, he goes into the fact that he is a transsexual, a cross-dresser. If you listen to his language when he's talking about it, he almost sounds upset that they never noticed, almost like he was leaving hints out that he was disturbed, that there was something wrong with him, and that he was hoping they would call him on it. But this is just when things started to change with me in 2013. It's when I started, um, I guess you could say cross-dressing, which is something you never knew I did. I was cross-dressing ever since high school. And what would happen would be when you guys would go to your bowling leagues and Jeremy would go with you, which was every Wednesday, I would either film a YouTube video 
you know, back in early high school, you know, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, I would pretty much always film a YouTube video between ninth and 10th grade on every Wednesday when you would go out the door. So I would either film a video or I would cross dress. And that's something I've kept to myself my whole life. I never told anybody about this. And it's something that probably shocks you, but at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, you never had a girlfriend or anything like that. So I guess it's expected, but, um, the more I wore girl clothes, the more I felt like that was who I was. Like I felt like I was a girl and I found out that I was, I was never meant to be a guy. I was just a female soul trapped in a man's body my whole life. Every three days since like 2016, I've been shaving my arms and legs and entire body every three days. You wonder what I'm doing in the shower for so damn long? I'm shaving my entire fucking body. I wasn't jerking off in there. <laughs> but nobody ever questioned that, which I don't know why. <laughs> I hid it for the longest time. I, I kept the, the girl razor in my freaking desk over there. And I just got tired of hiding it. I'm like, well, they're going to have to eventually know anyway. So I just started leaving it on the counter, but nobody questioned it, which I couldn't believe. That shocked me. As time went on, I thought like Rachel, like I thought my name was always Rachel, but I don't know. But that's when that started and that was the lead character for EGS, me. He also brings up the fact that he is obsessed with school shooters, namely the Columbine killers. I drew it. I drew my own version of that suicide picture. I literally traced over it and made my own version of it. If you look really close, you will see it. But unless you know exactly what it looks like, you won't even notice that it's there. But there's two angles of that suicide photo. Like, one's like the angle I mentioned. It's like an overhead view where he's over to the left like this and Dylan's like laying like this because the police had to roll them over to check for bombs after the massacre happened. The other picture was taken like head on. You could see like Eric like this and his hands kind of covering his face, but like his head is like completely obliterated. And then you can see, like, the wound on Dylan's head and all this. And I just, I loved it. And it wasn't sexual or anything. I wasn't turned on by dead people or corpses or anything like that. I was attracted to ghosts. Yeah. Don't worry, Mom and Dad. He doesn't want to fuck their dead bodies. He just wants to screw their souls. There's no, there's no cause for concern with an admission like that. But again, this was information he never opened up about. He didn't want to go to therapy. He didn't want to be helped. It wasn't something that he was seeking help for. I know you could be thinking, like, you could have gotten help. You could have seen a psychiatrist. You could have gotten help. But the truth is, that wouldn't be me. Me being on medication, sitting in therapy. No. That alters who you are. It's not me. Never would be. All throughout my life, I was never big on living. I hated life. I almost always did. I hated meeting people. You know that full well. I just hated going through everyday life. I always did. I just, I wanted to go to Grandma and pop -Op's house and get one of their handguns and shoot myself. Or completely douse myself with gasoline and light a match and hopefully it would kill me, you know. And that really comes down to the relationship that he had with his parents because there's a lot of buried anger there, especially directed towards his father. I'm your fucking kid and you don't know anything about me. You don't know how I truly feel about anything and I can't tell you that stuff. And then all he fucking seemed to care about was like me getting a full-time job and making money and then trying to move out of the fucking house and start my own life and all this shit, which I knew I, never, I was never going to do. It's all about money, isn't it? And guess what? Money's fucking worthless. Drop dead. I don't see why it was such a big fucking deal because I was still part-time at the store. I was still making money, you fucking whore. I was making fucking money. I wasn't just sitting around doing nothing. I was virtually full-time at the fucking store as a part-time fucking worker, you goddamn cunt. You're lucky I didn't fucking blow your goddamn head off. Very easily could have. Could have walked right into your room when you're about to fall asleep and blow your goddamn head off and then went to the fucking store. Very easily could have done that. But I didn't. Because I wanted you to fucking suffer.
and suffer hard. When's the last time you ever said you were proud of me? When's the last time you ever said I love you? When's the last time you ever did anything for me? Never. Never. It almost seems like part of his motivation was to punish them. Punish them for not knowing who he was and what he was into. For making him try to have a normal life. For making him try to go to school and get a job and move out and be successful. He was bitter and resentful for it. He was angry that they were pushing him that direction. And he wanted to make them suffer. Hello, my name's Randy. And I have a problem. You know, there's always a risk, people assume, when you discuss things like this. When you talk about a spree killer or a serial killer, that you're glorifying what they did. That by talking about it, you'll inspire others to follow suit. That people want to follow in their footsteps. What they fail to take into account is that when the mainstream media covers something like this, it's very cut and dry. They discuss the events and the tragedy, but they don't focus on the individual. And more importantly, they don't ensure that people don't want to follow it by doing one simple step. By mocking the shit out of this joke of a fucking human being. Randy Stairs is a transsexual brony that believed he could become a fucking cartoon ghost. He is a walking punchline. He was upset mommy and daddy didn't love him enough. He didn't want to get a real job. He wanted to do YouTube as a career. He wanted to become a ghost girl and paint himself with latex paint, put on a dress and play pretend. Now you could say there are a lot of things that contributed to that. That there was magical thinking involved, that that's a clear sign of schizophrenia. You could look at the events in 2013 and say that the car accident had some impact on him. That he had some kind of a brain trauma that flipped a switch and made him go insane. Either way, when you talk about Randy Stairs, if you want to ensure nobody wants to be like him, make sure that they laugh at him. Because nobody wants to be a joke. That's what this man's legacy is. Nobody's going to watch the videos he put up and think, my god, how badass. How inspiring is that? Randy Stairs is the fucking battleborn of spree killers. I feel no sympathy for him. I don't feel sorry for Randy Stairs. I feel sorry for the three people he murdered. Three people that did nothing to him. Three people that worked with him and had families of their own had mortgages and payments they needed to make, had children they had to raise, and were killed by this angsty piece of shit who wanted to play pretend and LARP in real life, who wanted to make mommy and daddy upset. Fuck Randy Stairs. Make fun of Randy Stairs. Show the videos Randy Stairs made to other people so they can laugh at what a failure Randy Stairs is. Nothing he did ever succeeded. Nothing he attempted ever found success. Fuck Randy stares. I'm not making any more epic vids. I'm done with YouTube. All right, I'm not fleeing the country. I'm not a child rapist. Here's the story. Were you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm local? <laughs> and what a story it is. It's a cautionary tale for all the would-be YouTubers out there that dream of one day attaining internet stardom, about how fast you can flirt with fame and then, the next day, immediately fall away from it. How you can go from making videos about slamming liquor teething dog shit off the street oh my god this is gonna be nasty as fuck this dude must have been eating hair or something on your face. oh my god don't do it all in pursuit of those sweet sweet clicks because you need that relevance you need that audience you want that stardom when looking into who shoe nice is as an individual as an online persona, a few things are going to be immediately striking. One is that he has over half a million subscribers. But the deeper you dig and the closer you look, other facts start to pop out one after the other. How can somebody with such a large install base have such incredibly terrible metrics? How can somebody with half a million subscribers only bring in 10 to 20,000 views per video? What exactly happens to explain that complete death of popularity? 
Here's a man who started out when YouTube was young and gained millions and millions of views from doing video after video of him ingesting the most horrid things you could imagine, drinking outrageous amounts of liquor, eating items that would be better served, put in other orifices in your body. A person whose popularity was spurred on by the numerous amount of coverage he received throughout the years, from his multiple television appearances to article after article after article, all talking about what Shoe Nice does online. People liked the freak show that his channel was. They liked being able to walk into the tent, hand somebody a ticket, and watch a midget fuck a bearded lady. That was what Shoe Nice was, a human garbage disposal, there for your amusement, for your friends to come gawk at. And because of that initial pull, he gained an enormous amount of subscribers. So how is it then that you could go from half a million subs, being on television, and being written about at numerous outlets, to barely getting 10 to 20,000 views per video? What explains that incredible decline? Well, that, that's the real story of Shoe Nice. Everybody keeps saying drink bleach. Well, I'm not going to do full bleach, but I'll do a multi-surface cleaner with bleach. Shu's empire of dirt began to accumulate, began to build upon itself, due to what I like to call the YouTube cycle. Now, the YouTube cycle is where a particular type of video format or style, a genre, becomes so overplayed due to its popularity that your videos within it become indistinguishable from anybody else's. Shu Nice is known for his ability to eat and drink almost anything and he would do video after video day upon day of the exact same format and for quite some time this paid off greatly for him it got him the attention of the press it got him onto television it got him hundreds of thousands of subscribers but as with any fad any YouTube cycle Others began to do it and do it better. Because at the same time that Shoe Nice was doing this, other people were putting together more interesting videos that went viral more easily, or they had a different take on it. Multiple eating channels and I will drink anything channels began to appear on YouTube. And as that audience had more and more choice as to where they could go to consume that type of video, Shoe's Pond got smaller and smaller and smaller. But that's just one facet, that's just one factor of why Shoe Nice turned out the way he did. Because even inside of a YouTube cycle, with all that competition around him, he still could have had an audience that would have been loyal to him. A larger component, though, would be Shoe Nice himself. Both his personality, his habits, and his appetites. These played the largest role in the decline of his channel and his spiral into insanity and irrelevance. Now, you may ask yourself, how is it that a man who has Nice in his username could have issues with anyone online. Surely this is a kind individual. But Shoe Nice doesn't play well with other people, and he's been like that for years. If you look back in 2012 during the King of the Web Awards, Boogie actually put up a video talking about this, as did the organizers of the event when they suspended him because of his behavior related to the competition. And an even more recent example of this would be his interactions with Ethan and Hila from H3H3. Don't give a single fuck about his subscribers. Jewish people are greedy and only care for themselves. Hila Klein is a whore. What the fuck is wrong with you? Fuck off, dickhead. You were my help. Now Shoe Nice trolls you until I die. Slam some more toilet paper to clean that shit that's been coming out of your mouth. That's in response to a tweet from Shoe Nice where he said, Fuck off. Hila is a whore from Israel. More like, Shoeless, your ass is homeless. Now, while many people would like to blame Shoe Nice's somewhat abrasive approach to other people online strictly on his intoxication, on his ingesting liquor and cleaning products. Looking through his history online, you see that he likes to start drama with other users. He's done this on YouTube. He did this on Live Leaks. He will find somebody with a larger subscriber base and start attacking them to get their attention, to try to get a response video. Because in his mind, that's how you get clicks. You create drama to get attention. He's done this with LA Beast. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
He's done this with H3H3. Ethan, you were a fucking scumbag emo five years ago, and now you think you're some kind of a god, fucking ooh, raising money for people. Well, all I want to know is whose penis is bigger, yours or Ela? He did this on live leaks until he was driven off the website and forced to leave this goodbye video to them. Done with your fucking website. Try to bring a little humor in. All you fucking people care about are people dying? Kiss my ass, bitches. Suck my dick. Lick my nuts. Fuck my dead mother. So now when you look in a broader context of things, with Shoe Nice now having to compete with more channels that are doing what he did better than he did, as well as his inability to network and relate with other people online, you start to see why his views began to diminish, why the sub count started to nosedive. But those things alone aren't what drove him to drinking piss and eating shit off the street. No, it takes a lot more than simple trolling online and a few competitors to put you into that position. If you were to take the time to go back through the archive of Shoe Nice videos and watch them one after the other, you're going to start to notice a few trends. Those trends usually revolve around his alcoholism because he wasn't just doing liquor slam challenges, he was doing live streams after them. And it was during these streaming moments or these separate videos where you got a better insight into the hunger, the appetite this individual has, and just how much he relies on liquor, and even more than that, hard drugs to survive. One day he whips out a can of crack. I said fuck it and took a blast. Hey everyone, Shoe Nice again. I'm on Molly's. I'm on Molly's. Now already with these factors you're starting to see a recipe for disaster. Somebody who's under pressure, their little kingdom is collapsing in on themselves. They're lashing out at other people to get attention. And on top of that they have a liquor and drug problem. These are all components to making your life go to shit quickly. All you need to do is watch a few of his videos and you can see just how absolutely blackout drunk he will get. It was fucking... It was... There was lemon juice coming out of every orifice on my body, including my penis head. Wow. And the effect that will have on his mental abilities and his ability to manage and run a YouTube channel. Now, anybody familiar enough with drug use and alcoholism is going to know that it's going to take a lot of money to fuel that. If you want to do crack every day, if you want to get drunk every day, you need a constant supply of cash to continually fuel that lifestyle. And that is where the real problems for Shoe Nice began. Well, basically, I'm just wasting your time making you come to another video and wasting your fucking useless life, your pitiful IP address. Go stick your fucking penis in your nasty girl's vagina while your fat ass mother videotapes it, because I don't give a fuck on sub. A simple search using the keywords shoe nice and scam will yield a host of results dating back multiple years, all having to do with the graft with the cons which Shoe Nice has perpetrated against both the unwary and his fan base alike. Now out of all these scams, they all seem to fall into one of three different categories. Charity, necessity, and bullshit. Throughout the years, Shoe Nice has said that he likes to help the homeless. In fact, he's run multiple campaigns to raise money for them. From the brown bag boys charity. I mean, you can do as simple a thing as just buying a brown bag from us in Shoe Nice We Trust. You take that dollar and you buy this brown bag, and that dollar turns into a can of ravioli or a bologna sandwich. To his own Indiegogo campaign, which raised a whopping $5 before Indiegogo shut it down, due to the multiple complaints of people saying that he was a scam artist. Now, while there exists video footage of Shoe Knight actually volunteering, at a local homeless shelter. Hey everyone, Shoe Nice again. Well, basically, we're serving the homeless and the needy of Denver. So, stand back and watch. There are no receipts or records to prove that he's given any money to charity. And multiple people have looked into this. And Shoe Nice repeatedly states that he gives the money to them. If you just donate to that Indiegogo, if you just buy one more brown bag, we can feed people. Which is a bit stunning, because if you remember his call-out video to Ethan from H3H3. Fucking ooh, raising money for people. It's almost like Shoe Nice doesn't like the idea of somebody actually doing and following through on what they say, rather than ripping people off of their money. While some could argue 
that Shoe Nice actually does contribute to charity and that he's been above board in regards to these homeless money drives. The other videos which exist are a little more cut and dry. These are the necessity videos, or as I like to call it, fuck you, pay me. Basically, we need a new camera, a nice one. One that costs $1,800, so we're like a TV show. But I'm not paying for it. You guys are. That's right, my YouTube community. Basically, I lost my ATM card, and I want to smoke more weed and get drunk still for Bike Week. So my PayPal information is below me. This isn't begging. Basically, if you can spare anything, PayPal, a dollar, a hundred dollars, Whatever it takes, I just got to get on a train and get back to Denver. Well, basically, I got arrested last night. Somebody robbed some old lady's pocketbook out of a car. So they came to the hotel where they thought the dude was at. They kicked in my hotel door and they blamed it on me. Either way, my PayPal's in my bag. I'm not big. Funnily enough, after telling his fan base they could unsub him and go fuck themselves, he tried going the Patreon route, which went about as well as you might imagine from simply looking at the page itself. Remember, he has half a million subscribers, and that's the amount he was able to bring in. One dollar. One. Oh, one dollar. <laughs> Now, the most entertaining out of all these categories would be the straight-up bullshit category. The I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. I get these great ideas, but I thought about this a while ago, and now I'm sticking to it. You're going to PayPal me five U.S. dollars and that video link, and the email will come through. I'm going to upload that video on my channel. For years, people said that he ran hustles asking them to give him something, and in return, he would do something for them. He'd feature them on his magnificent, amazing channel. Just pay me $20 and I'll do that for you. Just PayPal that money on over to me. And yet, shockingly, he never really held up his end of the bargain. It wasn't until recently that he really got blown the fuck out when somebody documented this and the video went viral. A user by the name of Tubes had been asked by Shu Nice to provide him with YouTube thumbnails because Shu was convinced that that was going to get him back on top. And so he was going to pay this gentleman to make him a set of thumbnails. And they reached an agreement for how much he would be paid to provide that service. And there'll be a link in the description to the full video if you want to go watch it. Shockingly, Shoe Nice once again didn't keep his word. Either way, this is staying up forever. Twos, you're such a loser. And you know you are, bro. You said you were eating crumbs when I caught you on Facebook out at a bar. You said two thumbnails took almost an hour, and you can make them in three to four minutes. So basically, either way, Shoe Nice is an alcoholic, hard drug user, who has scammed and alienated his own fan base, and put up a repetitive type of video to the point where even with a half a million subscribers, nobody watches his content anymore. His repeated attempts to branch out, to do in-real-life trolling, which is god awful, by the way. Oh shit, dude, what happened? Oh, the truck, the yeah, the truck slid into me. What truck, man? Uh, he's right over there idling, pointed to him. So what the? So, yo, no, yeah, what the fuck, too man? Too long, man? Yo, come here, just see if my face is fractured. So. Dude, right it's here. pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Not controlled like a motherfucker. Thanks a lot, bro. To do a roofing channel, which is basically a way to beg for money on Craigslist have all backfired. None have found success. Even his main channel still flounders with barely any views to support it. Shu is an example of a man who let his ego get the best of him, who allowed the pressure to drive him over the edge. He truly believed, because he made it onto television, because people wrote about his exploits, that he was going to be famous. He didn't want to accept the fact that he was merely a content creator on an internet platform. He thought himself better and beyond that. And that attitude, coupled with his addictions and his penchant for scamming people, have driven away everything that he hoped to build up. And now, now he pays the price for those decisions, because he will never be able to crawl his way back up. He has been to the top of the mountain, and then tumbled back down it like Sisyphus's rock. Thank ya. That's it, you little fucking son of a bitch. Right now.
Come here. You little fuck nugget. Come on. Hmm? Stop it. Stop the fucking car, you little fuck. Come on, stop the car. The fuck? Come on, you little fuck nugget. Who are you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm local? Inside. You hear me? I'm not inside! This is not reality! Not reality! Not reality! This is reality. YouTube is a snake constantly shedding its skin with iteration upon iteration upon iteration of how the website presents itself to the user. This change is usually inspired by a smug know-it-all dev that thinks that your usability and familiarity with the feature set is secondary to their artistic vision. But this wasn't always the case. Back in the day, those changes were much more gradual and spaced out, and the differences much more minor in comparison to what we see happen now. A video featured on the front page may garner a few hundred thousand views. Nowadays, a fat Korean man can hit that same amount within minutes rather than hours. But it's more than just the amount of eyes that were on a particular video. It was the content itself. With everything being so new and different, people that were innovative got attention. It's how people like the AVGN built up their celebrity status. They were the first person to do it. It inspired imitators, people that wanted to be just like that. Some outright stole the gag. Others tried to give their own variation of it, even spawning their own imitators who were an imitation of their imitation. And some people, well, fuck, we're not even, you know, that's a different video altogether. But nevertheless, you can see how the AVGN ended up becoming a genre in himself by simply doing something that nobody else had done before, and how all these people wanted to do that exact same thing and the market became flooded, fucking flooded with angry video game reviewers. And one of those reviewers was the Game Dude. And just who is the Game Dude? Well, he's the gamer with a bad attitude. The Game Dude, aka Alexander, was a Canadian film student who was inspired by the AVGN. In fact, he didn't state that he made reviews. They were satirical comedic parodies of angry reviewers on YouTube. And that, that must have been paying off because he was the 85th most subscribed comedian from Canada. And just a, what form of comedy did Alexander present? What was the flavor of his videos? Well, let's take a look at a few clips to give you a good idea of what it was that Alexander liked to do. Barbie is one of those shitty games, lost in the ocean of shitty games, that fulfilled its purpose of being a shitty game. Look at Barbie. What a scary bitch. And if that's not enough of a hint for how much he liked to ape the AVGN when it came to doing these satirical, comedic parodies, here's another, here's another clip to really drive it home. Rocky and Bullwinkle. More like Rocky bullshit! This game is a tiger taking a diarrhea of my ass. This game is a fuck full of rotten, disintegrating, regurgitated squirrel moose shit mixed in a blender. I'd rather clean the shitty asshole of a giant panda using my tongue. It sucks so much it fucks, it fucks so much it blows, it's the abomination of all time, a waste of time, and it's time to put an end to this ignominious travesty. And strangely enough, believe it or not, he was actually recognizable for what he did, at least up in Canuckland. In the land of the Maple Leafs, he was kind of a big deal. Because when he would walk into his local game store, they would do interviews with him. I've talked to him a few times, just like, with only by like, letters, pretty much. Because, you know, every time I try to talk to him on the internet, he never replies. I'm not like some weird, creepy, you know, guy with like a giant picture of the angry video game nerd in my living room that I like, yeah. <laughs> See, I like, to, I like to call that foreshadowing, that question, are you stalking him? It's a little bit of foreshadowing for what's coming up. Now, I'm sure you can gather by the video series this is, Internet Insanity, we're not here to talk about Alexander's fucking awful YouTube videos or his now defunct channel. That's not what makes him interesting. He's interesting for something completely unrelated to the YouTube videos. You see, Alexander met a young girl, a girl he loved deeply because he's a nice guy. 
and she just didn't understand how much he appreciated her. And I can think of no better segue into exactly what it was that happened than this particular clip. Well, I want one that's nice, but then again, most of the nice ones are kind of, you know, fat, unfortunately. I'm also looking for, you know, one that looks hot, then again, a lot of the hot ones are bitches, so it's like really, you gotta, you gotta find one in the middle, and that's, that's the trick, you gotta find one in the middle. Yeah, they're just, you know, <laughs> she's gotta have like big tits and nice ass, <laughs> and she's gotta be... <laughs> Young love can be a compelling thing, and that is the situation that Alexander found himself in. He was in love, in love with a girl named Alana. Now, Alana was to him, as he put it, his everything. She was the star around which his world turned. He was convinced that she was the one that he was destined to spend the rest of his life with. Their relationship to him was the first of its kind. He had never been in love before. He had never had a girlfriend before. He had never been intimate with anybody before. And so he was completely swept up in the process and dedicated himself to trying to make that relationship work. And for a few years, things went okay until 2012, when the couple began to hit a, a rough spot. Now, according to Alexander and some of the videos that he released, they had an open relationship around this time. And apparently, Alana found something outside the relationship during that time that was better than what Alexander was offering. Because by July of that year, by July of 2012, they were officially over. Now you can imagine, poor Alexander, this film student from Canada who has this recognizable YouTube review channel. He's utterly shattered by this. Alana is the woman that he loves and he will try to win her back in any way that he possibly can. I mean, hell, we've all heard this script before. Hollywood pumps these out by the dozens. We're talking a romantic comedy. Here's this poor schmuck that's in love with a girl that found somebody else and he's going to win her back. What could possibly be more romantic than that? She must have been just awestruck by his dedication to her. Alexander even went so far as to do romantic music videos to try to win Alana's heart back. Rick Astley, a little John Lennon, what woman wouldn't absolutely love that? Well, apparently, Alana. Wow, he is really screwed up. He's so obsessed, I think he follows me, and he keeps phoning me. He's such a creep. Yes, tell him to leave me alone, or I'll call the police. I already did file a police report. I'm not joking. Okay, he needs to stop thinking it's a joke. Oh, did I did I fail to mention the police reports? or the court case, or the massive amount of legal troubles that ended up driving Alexander to flee the country. I probably, I probably should back this story up a little bit. Well, it turns out that maybe Alexander went a little too full throttle in trying to win back the girl that he loves. Now, I have to walk a really fine line with this, because there's a bit of history I probably should explain before we go forward. A long time ago, this information was actually up and public on the internet. And that's because Alexander put up a lot of this himself, as well as other people that had interactions with Alana and her family. However, that quickly came to an end when these messages were sent to different people hosting that content. Now, the individual self-identifies as somebody working for the Crown Prosecution Services and threatens legal action if this information isn't pulled down from the internet. Well, what information is that? Well, that would be the court documents, the police reports, the 911 call, and the witness interviews all of which I have. Now, I have to try to find a way to present this information to, to really give you the full story without actually showing you this information. Because the last thing I want is some maple syrup-loving, LARPing Canadian to threaten to prosecute me because I'm talking about something they don't want me to talk about. I'm not going to reveal the identity of who Alana is. I know. I have the full name and everything. I'm not going to tell you that. I will show you screen caps that were publicly available. I will show you videos and blogs that were publicly available. 
However, when it comes to the police reports and court documents, I will give you a basic idea of what's in it, but I will not quote word for word, and I can't, I can't show it to you. But I do, I do have access to it, because somebody that archived this kept a complete collection of it. So what do those court documents say? I mean, how infatuated with Alana was Alexander? What was the game dude getting on up to with his spare time? Well, shortly after their breakup in 2012, Alexander, how do I put this? He went off the fucking deep end. He thought that if he dedicated every single fucking second of his waking day to trying to get her back, that that was the approach that was going to get her. I think he might have miscalculated. Because if you're calling somebody 60 times a day, stalking their house for upwards of 7 hours at a time, sitting across from it, and watching people come and go, talking to the neighbors, contacting family members, and even hiding in the bushes at night waiting for an opportunity to talk to the girl that you love as she leaves to go hang out with her friends. That might be interpreted as something other than smitten. Now, for those people that were subscribed to the game dude and wondered, hey, what happened to his co what happened to his content? He was doing all these game reviews and then they sort of stopped. Oh, you know, he was dedicating himself to other things as the legal process was moving forward because Alana not only filed police reports, not only did her mother file police reports, but there was actually an upcoming court case related to this. So basically, Alexander had the idea to back the fuck off, but he wasn't looking for a suggestion. Instead, he thought it would be a good idea to start uploading some very bizarre videos. And when I say bizarre, I'm talking like filming wildlife and then just uploading it. Sometimes there was commentary, sometimes there wasn't. Take a look at a, a just a smorgasbord of some of the animal videos that Alexander was releasing at around this time. Hey, want some hey, chocolate? Look, 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 look. Look, 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 look. Chocolate goose. Chocolate. Oh, you suck. Hello, lizard. Hello. Hello. How do you do, lizard? Alright, so uh, this video needs to be made right now. Now, Alexander by this time was aware of what was going on. He knew that they were in talks with the police and that the government might be getting involved. There was a court case coming up. He, he understood that. So what, what effect did that have? Did he stop doing what he did? No, no. Instead, he decided to start fucking with the police. He was convinced that they were screwing with him. So he decided the best course of action was to fuck with every cop that he came across as he was filming his animal videos. Shea, what is your badge number? 2355. And yours? You have a bit. Hmm? You can read, right? Free to tape all you want. How long is it going to go? Just curious. Where is it? Where is it? Come on! Come on, what, what is the fucking... What is... Oh, bitch! Get the fuck out of here! Fucking piece of shit! You keep following me, I'll call the police and get you on stalking! Now get the fuck out of here! Now, people at the time who knew him thought he was starting to act very strangely. Uh, I'm not even talking about Alana and her family. I'm just talking about people that were fans of his or people that he'd talked to on social media. So he wanted to get his story out. What better way to convince people that you're not fucking insane and stalking a woman, calling her house 60 times a day? What better way to convince them that that, you know, isn't weird than by making a two-hour-long toy dinosaur documentary detailing your relationship and breakup. Nothing says stability like playing with children's toys and recreating your heart being broken. Hey, uh, yo. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, uh, I'm not the same guy uh, that put uh, his arm around her shoulder. I'm a different guy. And I look up 
she's right in front of me. I'm like, holy fuck. She's like, you're stalking me. You're looking for me. And I'm like, yeah, I was, look I was looking for you so hard that I did not see you standing right in front of me. It hurts me more than it hurts you. Self-defense? No, she was just angry. Like I was like, yo, take this letter. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. You must take it, take it. And I like take duct tape and I, I duct tape the letter on her hand. I'm like, take the letter. It's like, fine, 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 fine. Now, there was a lot going on beyond the initial reported behaviors of pestering phone calls or hanging around her house or stalking her around the neighborhood, to which Alexander, in his infinite wisdom, directly responds to her and her mother while a police investigation is going on. There were also potential allegations hinted at and discussed about domestic violence, as well as notifications about being a person of interest because he was a gun owner. So you've got a real a real mixture there. Won't leave the woman alone, calls her all the time, hanging out in the neighborhood, won't take no for an answer, has a gun, might be potentially violent, filming bizarre videos and uploading them, making love ballads and sending them to her. You can, you can see there's a recipe for disaster there. Now, in the final few months as the police investigation is wrapping up, as Alana is explaining a few more details, they're talking about the incidents that have occurred over the last year and having to contact the police upwards of four times about Alexander's behavior, Alexander decides, hey, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to leave the country. I'm just going to, you know what, fuck Canada. I'm going to Mexico. And it's on his journey to Mexico, while all of this is going on, that he writes his perspective on what's going on. This is when he presents his magnum opus, his manifesto. Fuck Alana, fuck Jonathan, fuck Wahid, all three. They were my closest friends. And they're, all, they're all fucked off. And my family. I never want to see him again either. Especially my parents circumcising me. No, 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 no. Fuck you. That was mine. Fuck you. I knew there was something I was forgetting. Alexander's deep, unending hatred towards his parents for getting him circumcised. It's something he spent years and years and years ranting about. Even going so far as to join support forums to talk about the plight of being circumcised. Now, the game dude thought he was pretty clever when he joined the foreskinrestoration.net and inactivist network. Because around this time, even though these posts were back from 2010, somebody on Encyclopedia Dramatica who was working on his article happened to find these, and he went back and edited every post he ever made, meaning that you couldn't find out what he was talking about. That's, that's pretty clever, game dude. You really showed everybody. Except you forgot the fact that when somebody on that forum quotes a member, Regardless of whether they edit their original post or not, the quote stays the same. So when these admins responded directly to you, talking about your purchase of a TLC Tugger, and for those of you wondering what that is, here's a picture. I'll leave the rest up to your imagination. When those admins quoted you, they forever snapshotted what you had to say. So let's take a look. I don't have a retainer, but I suppose there's no harm in tugging 24-7. Guess I could just use the TLC Tugger without a strap or MRS for less tension here or there. Is it safe to use that MRS remover stuff for the TLC Tugger to remove the sticky goo? <laughs> when I apply the TLC Tugger, does there need to be like a millimeter of inner skin beneath the outer cone to know what I'm stretching? <laughs> Otherwise, I assume the TLC Tugger would be stretching the shaft skin since all the inner skin would be inside the cone. Would stretching slowly reduce the suture holes? How would a plastic surgeon fix them? And wouldn't that be really expensive? There's only like three together, and they're not that big. I started tugging with the strap at half its maximum length, causing way too much tension. After taking off the TLC tugger, a liquid bubble, two red dots, and a small red line formed. What are they? And where did they come from? The next day, the liquid bubble and red line almost fully disappeared, but the two red dots barely minimized. Should I be concerned? I now have the strap at about 5 inches for maximum length, and it seems to be the perfect length. It does get slightly bothersome after 4 to 5 hours, though. Starting out, how many inches away from the tugger should I put the safety pin? <laughs> Apparently, some people have experienced problems tugging at night. Should I avoid tugging at night for now? Well, Alexander, those are some fantastic questions. It's a shame that you remove them, because people seeking the answers will never know. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to the manifesto, and the manifesto is really two things together. One is a blog that Alexander wrote detailing his entire experience, and the other is a series of videos he did explaining what happened. Both of these are retardedly long. 
the videos go on for upwards of hours and the blog is basically a war and peace version of a WordPress. There's far too much content to cover so I'm going to try to hit the highlights for you. As I said the manifesto especially the blog portion of it is a massive endeavor. It is a blog that he ran where he put up multiple parts explaining his interactions with Alana and everything surrounding all the events that had taken place over the last few years. And it is far too large of an undertaking for me to try to go through it in its entirety. Instead, I just want to focus on a few points of interest. I mean, after all, if a woman accuses you basically of stalking her, what better way to prove your innocence as a video game reviewer on YouTube than using video game characters to show that she was completely wrong? I know when I walk into court with the charge of stalking and harassment over my head that Pac-Man is the guaranteed solution to prove to the judge that I am in fact not crazy or stalkery at all. He even used cutting-edge CSI technology to render 3D landscapes to help really illustrate what happened in regards to the bushes incident. Clearly walking in a diagonal path towards those realistic bushes. And uh, she just misinterpreted that because she didn't... they're, they're transparent. <laughs> You can see through the bushes, read the description. But perhaps the most interesting piece of information to really be gleamed from the entire blog itself is that Alexander himself is a victim. While she may claim that he bugged her, he harassed her, he maybe even stalked her, Alexander? Alexander claims that Alana raped him. Alexander's main claim is that Alana raped him by deception, that she was cheating on him, that they didn't actually have an open relationship and that by cheating on him, she was exposing him to the risk of STDs. Therefore, Alana is guilty of rape. We would have had sex numerously had I never seen this conversation. Therefore, she is either a rapist or an attempted rapist had she not technically already raped me when we got intimate and French kissed in her room after the lie. Even if it's far-fetched to call it rape, or even sexual assault, I still feel violated by my first love and best friend for around three years. Now, this is one of the points that Alexander actually brings up quite a bit, is that uh, their open relationship wasn't open. He was cheated on, and that was the stress of the relationship. He does have a side to it, and he presents it in this manifesto that he wrote for everybody to come read. And it's really hard to go through all of that and uh, digest it. The videos, on the other hand, a little more easy. His Mai Tai adventures as he's on the road to traveling. You can even look at the map to try to figure out where where did this take place exactly? Was he in Vancouver? Was he in LA? Did he get to California? Was this the time that he was in Mexico? We know it's not Hong Kong. That doesn't happen for a few more years. So where in the world is Game Dude when he filmed this video? The no contact rule for one month. Called her. I was drunk. So nervous. I got drunk to suppress the energy. Stupidest thing I ever did. Called her, she's like, stay the hell away from me. Fucking snapped. Called her a billion times. Got so depressed. Took 10 Advil tablets. Thought it would do the trick. Yeah, dude, I was fucked. Just wanted the nightmare to end. Now, as I sorted through this information and going over this this story in the archive of all the, the screen caps and the videos and just everything that was there, it's hard to get a definitive timeline. Certain events don't really match up, and certain locations don't fit all events. I can say for certain that Alana and Alexander had a relationship, that that relationship turned sour in the middle of 2012, that they tried to have a friendship or an open relationship, depending on who you're talking to, for upwards of a year after that, that following that, Alexander's behavior, even from his own admissions, became a bit over the top, that he began to violate, as he said, no contact orders, calling her up at all hours of the day. Even his own diagrams illustrating where the bushes are still show that he was going on her property. We know police reports are filed. We know that there was a court case coming up. Now, did he leave the country right before the court case? Did he leave it immediately after the court case? I don't know. Alexander had made statements saying that he actually did go to court. He went to court, and when she was supposed to take the witness stand, she had an emotional breakdown, ran out of the courtroom, and the case was dismissed. After which, he decided to flee the country because he was scared he'd get prosecuted again. So a lot of this is really, it's hard to pin down exactly what the fuck happened to the game dude after 2015 or so. He did go to Hong Kong. He stated that in a few different messages to different individuals. And more recently, there's a short film that he was a part of, that was catered by a company in Vancouver. So he must obviously have gone back to Canada at some point, but if he's still there, who knows? 
what we do know for certain is this that when you put crazy up on the internet it is forever there that no matter which way the court case ended up breaking no matter what the relationship with Alana looks like in this day and age the record of your nutty ass behavior will forever be enshrined for anybody that cares to look it up you could be the most innocent person in the world but you still wrote a novel length manifesto and filmed yourself playing with dinosaur toys reenacting your breakup with the girl that doesn't want to talk to you anymore but I suppose the upside is even though the game dude's YouTube video reviews may have been complete and utter shit, his personal life sure is entertaining. You guys threw me in a concentration camp where you tortured me for 15 months. You also kidnapped my children and gang shocked my house! Were you trying to get crazy with this, see? Don't you know I'm loco? I'm not <laughs> Louisiana State University faculty and staff were alerted to a threat during the week. That threat apparently relayed via YouTube video. Well, how, how serious could a threat via YouTube video actually be? Because of these threats, Dave, people at Louisiana State University campus were frightened. In fact, Louisiana police had departments across the country looking for this woman. And tonight, she is here in the King County Jail. Apparently serious enough to include a nationwide manhunt leading to the arrest of the suspected individual. That person, the person you saw in the introduction, would be Amanda. Now, Amanda had a very specific message addressed to a few particular professors at the university. And she went about getting that message out in a, a creative way. She used the YouTube video platform to make sure they, they got that message. And uh, they definitely got it, as you could tell from the police response. Now, Amanda isn't your typical school shooter, and that would be because she isn't a school shooter at all. None of the messages that Amanda sent to the staff at LSU contain any threats of violence. She wasn't planning on showing up with an AK-47 and shooting people. She wasn't going to drive a van into the science building and blow it up with a bomb. And yet still, even absent the threat of actual physical violence, there was a nationwide manhunt to find her, to arrest her and detain her. I'm sure as you've gathered from the introduction there, Amanda has a bit of a gripe with the university. What with them having put her into a concentration camp and gang-sacked her apartment, which is a new one on me. I'm familiar with gang-stalking. Not with the practice of gang sacking. Nonetheless, Amanda, or as she's known on YouTube, Druid Fockett, felt that she had been persecuted. And the reason she feels persecuted is because of her personal intimate history with the LSU University and its staff. Now, during the course of the week that she was on the lam from the police, while she was avoiding being put into one of those onerous burlap sacks that apparently got her once before, she uploaded nearly 100 videos to YouTube, all addressed that people she felt wronged her. But to get a good understanding of where this really all starts, you have to look at her earliest videos. Now, sadly, there aren't many of them to look at, but the ones that are around help you to piece together what might have happened and started this chain of events leading up to where we are today. Now, these earliest videos, they were uploaded at the tail end of 2016, and they give some real insight into what her initial gripe with the university just might have been about. This particular video, Druid Fockett had re-uploaded. This is the one she claims got her gang sack from Louisiana State University. So let's take a look and let's see if we can piece together exactly, exactly what went wrong. You probably didn't feel anything, but I did. It's like uh, butterflies inside. <laughs> It, it looks like somebody maybe a little bit hot for teacher. I feel like we shared a few moments. Okay, maybe it was just me. But like, when you took me to the second floor in the lab back there, and you held the gelatinous material in your hand, and you told me to touch it. There was something sensual there, no? Looks like she's got a little bit of a crush there. Maybe wants a relationship. I should so be your girlfriend. Oh my god. Okay, but if I can't be your girlfriend, I should be your friend. Shouldn't I? Come on. 
No. Why not? We'd be good for each other. Oh, you hear that? You should let me be your girlfriend. We could be friends instead. Just let me... Let me get near you. Why else would I got so upset when you bit me out in an email? You know, humiliated me. Told me I was harassing Dr. Ingold when I was doing nothing of the sort. I shall say. God, that was a fucked up email, you know? It was. But, yeah, maybe I overreacted a little bit. Okay, I, uh, I understand I may have crossed the line. I may have went over the line. A little bit. I was just very hurt. Because I was, you know, I mean, I was in love with this amazing guy. And and yes, I did overstep a boundary for sure. You know, that was an inappropriate email about another professor. I sent on the freaking university email. Okay, I get it. Maybe emailing the entire university about that slut in the other department you're looking at, motherfucker was stepping over the line, but really, we would be good together. Because everybody thinks you're a fucking asshole. But you make a bad impression on people, okay? Everybody hates you. It's true. But I totally love you, and we should be, we should be together forever. Had a bit of a thing for the professor, maybe overstepped her boundaries as a 35-year-old student with children in trying to get him to date her, and threatening other faculty that he, I guess, talked to while he walked by in the hallway? But an overly emotional student, is that really a reason for her to be gang-sacked? LSU sounds like a horrible university. I mean, if we take a look at the other early videos, you can see that she's a very stable individual. See disclaimer of those in violation of restraining order, for I have grown weary of the bullying, cyber-stalking, monitoring, unauthorized recording, etc., etc., that threaten the sanctuary that has already done been declared along with everything else and the outrage of the declaration of genocide on me and my children kind. Fucking cyberbullies and their never-ending genociding of children. When is it going to end? Octung. Any refuse or refuse or refuse, etc. that has ever gone by any variation of the following surname is not allowed to have ever viewed this video. It is not permitted to subscribe to this channel nor any social media of mine nor is permitted to ever catch wind or hear rumor about etc 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 this is a restraining order of sorts you will stay far away any tapping of keys against me is your contribution to the genocide of my kind as an ambassador in your piece of shit foreign wasteland of artificial non-existence non-dreams of nothingness and if your if your name matches any of the people listed below you are a genociding cyberbully and you have no authorization to view these videos or talk rumors about Druid Fockett, remember that. Now, at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, maybe Amanda is mentally unbalanced. Maybe she has some kind of uh, mental illness. And uh, her infatuation with a professor at the university went a little farther than what we heard in that video. Again, there's, there's only so much evidence. There's only so much videos from that time period that are left. So it's hard to piece together everything. Maybe if we look at a few more of these early videos, we'll get a, a better idea of her personality. And there's been chattering, cucucheando, chismosas. I've been accused of being a free tod. It's what, something along those lines as a free tod. It's a free tod. I don't know what I just said, that only 500,000-ish of you could understand due to the lack of roundtable technology and stuff. Um. So okay, I am the the free Todd, <clears throat> and collective you. That would be everything of the pretty soon going to be amended meaning of genus homo. <laughs> that thing genus. Homo, 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 are you a homo? Well, genus homo, the homo what, the homo happa what, the homo happa ha, huh? the homo sapio, what, what, homo superior, huh? homo puro, 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 pura, 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 pura cebollo, o si no, pura mierda, que mejor. I hope you genociding cyberbullies understand you're dealing with the one and only free tard. Amanda Druid Fockett, the free tard of the internet. And if you don't understand what that means, well, she explains it quite well. What does that mean? Like they say, there's a saying, idiom, 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 that collective you retards, which 
Heretofore, 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 notwithstanding, notwithstanding, <laughs> regardless, regardless, irregardless, irre irregardless means you're retarded because that's not the correct meaning of correct, all correct, okay is what? Exactly. Well, maybe you're too dense. Maybe her words don't reach you well enough. Maybe you have difficulty understanding these complex ideas. So let her explain it to you with the dance of her people. Look at her get down with that rhythm. You know, if her and Terry Davis got together, they could make the most kick-ass DDR game that ever fucking existed. But all these videos, well, they're from the end of 2016. They're her old videos. So what exactly happened between then and now? Well, like Amanda said at the very beginning of the video, she was put in a Nazi concentration camp. Now, I'm not sure what the reason for that is. Could it be the cyberbullying, genocide-loving online trolls that hunt down freetards? Could it be a professor scared by her dedication and devotion to him? Maybe people were just upset with her love of the dance. Or perhaps she assaulted a bus driver and a deputy sheriff, but you know what? I don't take the word of any glow-in-the-dark motherfucker, let alone the press. They told me Hillary was going to be president, and it's like year number two a drumpf. So get that shit the fuck out of here. No, we need to go to the source for this. We need to go directly to Druid Fockett. So what does Amanda have to tell us? Where has she been for the last year and a half? I have been in a Louisiana sterilization camp for 15 months. I was abducted on 9 November 2016. They broke my arm last May. I have been shackled, cuffed, chained, and dragged into illegal proceedings. And you've had me as a guinea pig in your Nazi concentration camp for 15 months. That sounds horrible. Oh my god, they broke her fucking arm. They broke her arm and they kept her in chains? This is absolutely fucking nightmarish. But what role did LSU play in this? You ousted me from campus. Louisiana State University in Shreveport. About two weeks before you abducted me. Why didn't you execute me in the torture facility? So it seems as if she was evicted from the university two weeks prior to the incident that got her sent to Auschwitz. But if you think that's where the conspiracy ends with the luminescent law enforcement Americans and LSU, you would be wrong. We're talking about a nefarious plot that goes back at least three decades. Those people have been after me since I, they kidnapped me when I, what, 1983. I am John Bennett Ramsey. Okay in Carswell Air Force Base, right, castrated me when I was a baby after Cynthia utterly tortured me. It's called gaslighting. When your assassination attempts failed, you just say, it's crazy, and you snatch up its kids and all its possessions. This is what you've done to me. I fucking knew it. It was the goddamn Air Force that kidnapped John Benet Ramsey and castrated her. Now, if only we could connect the Podestas to this. Maybe they did the castration off of the airbase at like a local pizzeria. Wrap this fucker up in a nice, neat little bow. This is genocide. You have stolen my only relatives, and you have programmed them against me. You have indoctrinated them in your whore religion and told them that I was in a crazy house and I just didn't want to get better. Meanwhile, you had me in a concentration camp. A facility that we never got to leave, unless we were being dragged in chains to the circus. I want you to put yourself in her shoes. Imagine being tortured day in, day out at Auschwitz. And then one day they drag you out in chains, and you think it's freedom. But it's not. They're sending your ass to the fucking circus.
Now, Druid Fockett's YouTube account, Amanda's account where she uploaded these videos, had only a handful that dated back to the later half of 2016. And then suddenly there was a large influx of uploads. And it was during this week of frantic YouTube uploads that she began to lash out at the LSU faculty. Now, you would think that all the videos she uploaded during the week that she was on the run were all addressed to the LSU faculty, but you'd be wrong. Amanda likes to talk about all sorts of different subjects that her audience might find interesting. God hates fags. And Cindy Sutherland. Donald Trump gave order to assassinate 463-89-8339 genocide. And my personal favorite, 415-553-0123, niggers have claimed San Francisco. Help. HTTP. SanFranciscoPolice.org. Chief of Police. As the week progressed along, you could start to see a pattern emerge. Aside from the LSU videos that were directed at staff and the ones touching on various subjects she was interested in, you could begin to see her mind fraying at the edges. Her train of thought began to meander. She had difficulty constructing coherent thoughts. Her video titles didn't match up with the subject matter. And her behavior started to go from being passably normal to downright bizarre. <laughs> Money, 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 money. <laughs> money, 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 money. <laughs> Why do you talk like that? Uh, that's not your best song. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I gotta, 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 You're not going to kill yourself. You can't. Unless you really want to. Hey. <clears throat> ooh, ooh, uh, get her, get her, get her, kill her, kill her, kill her, kill her. <laughs> ooh, uh. Oh, it's one of those niggers. <laughs> That's a nigger, guys. Uh, hey, nigger. Nigger Scott. Uh, take all the other ones of you and leave. Around day four or five, this actually all culminates with the hotel management and local law enforcement evicting her from her hotel room. I told you, I'm not going to tell you who I am. Okay, I need to talk to somebody that can work with this information. You have two of your people or, yeah, there's two people outside of my door demanding I come out and I will not come out. So what are they going to do to me? Hi, there's... Two police outside of my hotel room. It's at the Sir Francis Drake off of Powell Street. It's room 1008. Um, why are they at my door, please? I'm on the phone with the police right now. You're breaking into my door? One of the stunning things about all of this is that during this eviction process, the law enforcement where she was staying were unaware of what was going on in Louisiana, even though the news report earlier had specified that there was a nationwide alert out regarding her saying she could be potentially dangerous. At first, she was fairly calm and collected talking to both hotel staff as well as local law enforcement trying to find out why they were trying to get into her room. That facade, however, much like her videos, fell away fairly quickly. I am not okay with this at all. I want you all to leave immediately and leave me alone. Oh, you don't think that will happen? You mean that's not going to happen because you're here to assassinate me. This is an assassination on 463-898-339. You're here to assassinate a single mother. That you're, you're hanging up in my face. One of the more interesting things about all of this is it might not have been her behavior per se that actually got her evicted. But instead, the issue she brought up. Right? There's these people outside my room saying they're going to barge in here. And they said it because I smoked a cigarette in here. I was actually given an ashtray, okay? But if that's the problem, I will not smoke another cigarette in here, okay? So. Earlier on in the week, she had already had encounters with hotel staff asking her not to smoke in a room. She, of course, hand-waved away these warnings that she was given. You see, I would love to smoke right now, but... They said no. What happens if I smoke? 
they charge me? What? Another million dollars? This might help to explain why it was the law enforcement agents that showed up with the hotel manager weren't aware of who she was and why they needed to be on alert about her. Either way, she ended up having to pack up and leave. Yeah. You said it's an eviction, so does that look bad on like me? Like if I try to get another hotel and they show up, oh, it's been evicted before type? Okay, so, okay. But not before leaving the best review that she could possibly think of. Worst hotel ever, you'll never guess. If managers would like to be anonymous, no surprise as you are planning for 463-898-339. Comp my nine year stay and this will go offline. If I am joined, we'll need larger accommodations. If anyone looks weird at me, seriously, Dan, wine, thank you for the religious creed exception and for keeping my persecuted creed anonymous. I appreciate the ashtray you provided. All the hotel staff has to do to make amends is copper a decade's worth of free rooms. We ate thousands of dollars of sushi, comped, lots of money in comps, and we ate thousands of dollars of sushi. So what's a girl to do? You've escaped the evil Nazis that held you in captivity for 15 months. LSU and the law enforcement agents, they're out to get you. You've been evicted from your hotel room where you've uploaded batshit insane videos multiple times per day for the last four or five days. Well, of course, you cut your hair into a manic pixie dream girl and then upload a video for every letter of the alphabet on your train ride to another state, making sure you keep the audio off because you wouldn't want people to know about your super secret plan on where you're going. And how well did that super secret plan work out? Not so well, because apparently it wasn't a super secret. At least not when there's a nationwide manhunt underway for you, and you upload a video giving your exact location in Seattle. Might not have thought that one through well enough. And so, much like the beginning of our story, we know where it ends. Like the news report had said, Amanda ended up getting caught in Seattle. Law enforcement rounded her up, and she went before the judge. The story of Druid Fockett is actually really interesting. When you read the headline, if you were to stumble across that story in your newspaper or on television, you would think that it was just a student that made some kind of a threat and they've been dealt with. But it goes so much deeper than that. This lady lives completely within delusion. She has an absolute disconnect from the reality around her. And that fueled all the interaction she had with staff at Louisiana State University, with the hotel staff she ran into, with everybody she interacted with. And yet somehow, up until the age of 35, she was able to have a family, she had children, she was attending college, and then for some reason it was like somebody flipped a switch. She started to go further and further into the deep end, not able to pull herself back, getting violent with strangers, attacking a bus driver and a sheriff, getting locked up, getting out, and immediately resuming the behavior that got her incarcerated and put into an institution in the first place. When you watch the videos she's collected, it gives a really good insight into mental illness. You don't just hear it in the crazy things she says. You see a physical change. And I'm not just talking about her early videos compared to her later videos where there's an obvious weight loss that took place. I'm talking about the way she carries herself, her mannerisms, her features, the way she moves her face. Even her voice changes from video to video, having different accents, speaking different languages, having different approaches to talking about subjects. Now, I can't be certain what awaits Amanda as she goes forward through the court system for a second time, but I do know one thing for sure. In about 15 to 16 months, we're going to get one hell of a week's worth of interesting YouTube uploads. <laughs> Look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. So let me okay, give Kurt, you the answer. This is a little nutty. So, I gotta be honest. Were you trying to get crazy with this thing? Don't you know I'm local? All hail the man called Calamity. Bad luck personified. The answer to the age-old riddle, what would happen to your life if you had sex with that black cat under a ladder? Well, I'll tell you what. You'd be Kurt Eichenwald. You can say what you want about the boys at Blizzard, but look at that reflection mapping. Or ambient occlusion. These are all technical terms. I don't know what any of it means. 
but it looks like the sun's directly above him. It's almost realistic. You could reach out and touch that. Now, Kurt, well, he's the sort of man that doesn't settle for second best. Most people would take a horrific embarrassment happening to them and call it quits. That's where they draw the line. They've achieved all they want to achieve in the realm of making themselves look like a jackass. But not Kurt. He's got that Goku get him attitude. That one's for you, buddy. I know you'll appreciate it from one weeb to another. Don't worry, I'm going to pack more of them in there. We'll get to that later. Well, Kurt, he doesn't settle for second best. He's going to keep overachieving. He's going to have that drive to move forward. There's always another bar to grab at. And he will outdo himself time and time and time again. But to really understand the story of Kurt and the catastrophes which surround him, we have to go all the way back to the beginning. Because who exactly is this man? And where did he get his start? So why don't you have a seat right over there? And let's begin. For five years, beginning when I was 13 years old, I operated a pornographic website featuring images of myself floated on the internet by webcams. I was paid by more than a thousand men to strip naked, masturbate, and even have sex with female prostitutes while on camera. That young man giving testimony before the commission is Justin Berry, someone who found himself lured into the insidious side of the internet a then young teenage boy who thought his webcam would be a means to meet new people, to make friends online, and to be able to reach out to others with common interests to help take care of the loneliness he felt in his day-to-day -day life. Instead, he found himself the focus of people who wanted to exploit him. As time went on and his interactions with these men continued, the requests they were giving him to simply do a stream or to put himself on webcam with only his shirt off morphed into more and more extreme and explicit sexual acts. As the years went by, the relationship he had with his abusers moved past purely a entertainer-customer relationship into that of a business partner. Opening up websites such as Justin Friends to continue his streaming service, Justin Berry's story first came to light through the New York Times and the reporting of Kurt Eichenwald. Within his report, Kurt recounts how he first met Justin. His attempts to bring Justin away from this group of people, to get him to go forward to law enforcement, to bring evidence against the men that exploited him, to hopefully get charges brought and to get convictions so that these same people could not prey on other children. Through Kurt's reporting and his actions, he was able to get Justin to do just that. The story went national. It became a big piece of news. It won Kurt an award. All was looking well for Eichenwald. It was something to hang his hat on. He had saved a young man who was formerly a child porn star, brought about the beginnings of justice to get child pornographers and exploiters and molesters brought before the courts. Just another in a long line of successful stories that Kurt had written over the span of his career. An investigative reporter, a journalist who had a reputation for being detail-oriented and meticulous with what he did. And it was that mindset and that consistency on Kurt's part that won him the accolades of his peers. And yet it wasn't long after this report was published within the Times that issues began to crop up around Kurt and his relationship to the story, particularly the source, Justin Berry. Numerous outlets began to report on inconsistencies on how Kurt had conducted his investigation as well as his relationship with this subject matter. Actions which seemingly went against the ethics policy and the standards and principles laid out at the New York Times as well as numerous other papers when it comes to how a journalist interacts with a story. One of the first issues to be raised within a year of this article going up was the fact that Kurt had paid Justin Berry money. It came out that Kurt had written a check to Justin for $2,000, something which the paper, the New York Times, prohibits. And yet Kurt said that it was a honest mistake. It was even more than an honest mistake. He had stated that he had met Justin and a month before he even decided to write an article about Justin or his line of work, he had decided to give him $2,000 to get his life in order. That it was a personal loan that would be paid back to him, which it was. And yet he only neglected to mention this because he was under a deadline. He was working 15 to 18 hour days, seven days a week to get this story compiled. And so it conveniently slipped his mind. When news that Kurt had paid money to Justin Berry, the source of the story, came out, the New York Times responded. It was put out there that this was an honest mistake, that it didn't affect the investigation, it didn't affect the reporting, and it didn't affect the important nature of what Kurt had written about. That this was the only mistake and the only payment that had been made. $2,000, perhaps another $10 payment, but that was it. 
There was no more money. Justin Barry had been cut a check for $2,000 and not a penny more, except for the other $1,100 that Kurt neglected to mention, a amount that was paid not just to Justin Barry, but to Justin Barry's business associate, the man that was running the website with him, a man who was later charged and convicted. That $1,100 payment wasn't disclosed until the court case began to proceed. And what was Kurt's response to that? Well, that's when he brought up epilepsy. Kurt went on to explain that this was a medical condition that he had and that it affected his memory and he had kept it a closely guarded secret. So the first time he had cut a check for $2,000 was before the story even took place. It was a personal business loan which he simply forgot about. The second time he had paid $1,100. It was an epileptic fit which wiped his memory out and he didn't remember it at all. Even though when you look at the reporting around the issue. It seems that Kurt was taking measures to make sure that it didn't get connected back to him, since the money was paid through PayPal under different pseudonyms. Stranger still is when you begin to look at the timeline of how that money affected Justin Berry's activities, as well as other allegations that came out as reported per NPR. In January of 06, the Times received an email from Mitchell's mother. That was a man that was later convicted, the man that helped run Justin Friends with Justin Berry. Among her accusations was that Eichenwald had fed would several thousand dollars to help fund Barry's website. Eichenwald blew off the accusation, calling it, quote, a crappy lie. The NPR coverage of the Eichenwald story and the subsequent fallout from it raises some interesting questions. Why was it that after twice being shown to be inconsistent with the truth, whether that was a lie of omission, an intentional lie, or a impaired memory, why is it once all that information had come out that the New York Times didn't go back and look at the email they received from a man directly connected to the case from his mother saying that Eichenwald had personally paid thousands more to get Justin Berry to open up another website? Now that other website, the Justin Friends one, why is that so key to this entire story? Well, a Gawker article might actually shine some light onto that. This is back from 2007. Kurt Eichenwald has some explaining to do. In the article, it goes over the details about the initial $2,000, which wasn't mentioned. And it sets forward a timeline. Now, there are a few key pieces of information that come forward from this that tie back into the money that Eichenwald had given Barry. The first being that JustinFriends.com suddenly became active again. This website, which had existed but was completely defunct at this point, suddenly goes active once more. And it goes active once more after the money was received from Eichenwald by Justin Barry. Now, the second more contentious piece of information that comes to light from this particular article, as relating back to Justin Friends, is that after the website became active once more, Justin puts on several shows. These are legal. Justin is almost 19. He also uploads videos of himself when he was 17, as well as a video of him masturbating with an underage boy named Taylor. This is a frequent claim by a person who claims to be a business partner of Justin Berry, Timothy Ryan Richards, or his supporters. Richards was convicted in October 2006 of distribution of child pornography, as well as other counts. It is unverifiable. When you gather together all these different sources, all the reporting that's been done about Kurt Eichenwald, about the New York Times, and the story on Justin Berry, Details begin to emerge which cast a, a cloud of doubt over the integrity of the story and the people involved with it. When looking at this information and parsing through it, you're confronted with numerous facts. Those being that Kurt Eichenwald made numerous payments to Justin Berry. These payments were made through a number of different methods under a number of different names. Eichenwald gave different excuses for why that was never disclosed. Within 10 days of receiving that money, a site that's run by Justin Berry, as well as a business associate who would later be convicted for child pornography, suddenly becomes active again. Another defendant who was convicted as well for child pornography alleges that once the site became active, within a few days, videos of underage boys engaged in sexual activities were put up and were viewable by members of the website. When you look at that sequence of events, and you take Kurt Eichenwald's statement at the beginning of this, that this was a month before he had any interest in writing a story about this. And within two to three weeks of having given that money to Justin Berry, a website is now up and active and distributing, or allegedly distributing, child pornography. It makes one wonder, it calls into question the integrity of the people involved. Other outlets, such as truthrevolt.org, follow this up with even more information. 
For those of you that have never heard of this website, it's one that was founded by David Horowitz and Ben Shapiro. That will be funny for another reason later on in the video. Newsbusters notes that even outlets like NPR ultimately found horrifying details, such as an account believed to have been from Eichenwald, had high-level administrative access to the child porn site Justin Friends, which would have allowed him to closely monitor the site's business. And it would seem that even at the time this was taking place in the subsequent years after the article went up, numerous outlets had qualms about what was happening. I think, though, that NPR really helps to highlight this by listing out what they call three primary questions for the Times. Does the Times now plan on having Eichenwald's reporting during his tenure at the paper verified in light of the additional undisclosed payments he made to Barry? Does the Times plan to investigate if the money Eichenwald gave Barry was used by Barry to operate the website merely to generate a story? Does the Times plan to investigate, or has it investigated, why Ingracia declined to confirm the veracity of the email that accused Eichenwald of both exchanging funds with Barry and potentially funding Barry's web operation. But I think the most damning question, and the most pertinent one, is that second one. Was the money used to operate the website merely to generate a story? Take a moment to look at the details of everything surrounding this, of everything that's been reported about it. Eichenwald meets a young man. He gives him money. And seemingly a month later, he has a story about child pornography, about a website, about a former performer, and about men that are going to be arrested. If Eichenwald had not given Justin Barry the money, and that money had not been used to restart the website, and Barry had not continued on with his activities, would there have been any arrests? Would there have been any distribution of child porn? Would there have been an active child pornography website? Did the Times, did Kurt Eichenwald, do this merely to generate a story. Now, these are merely questions. I'm not making any definitive declarative statements. I want to be very clear on that. I am just asking questions. So there you have Kurt Eichenwald, the only man in history who could rescue a child porn star, write a story that leads to arrest, and still find some way to fuck that up and look bad afterwards. But that's a trend which Kurt has continued onward for many years to come. Because if there is one thing Kurt is an expert at, it is making Kurt look bad. I just had a seizure. Wow, that was a bad one I owe, the pain of seizures. I have seizure pain. I have pain from the seizure. Ma'am, that was not a seizure, that was a dance move. December 15th, 2016 was a bad day to be Kurt Eichenwald. And it is a pity because it held such promise. Kurt was excited. He was going to be on Tucker Carlson that evening at 7 p.m. And while Kurt would leave a memorable impression on the audience, it probably wasn't the impression he was hoping to go for. Instead of the reputable journalist with a long storied history of writing investigative pieces that delve into issues people are interested in, he came off as, how, how can I put this gently, batshit insane. Now, the entire segment was 10 minutes long, and I would love to show the entirety of it to you, but I don't think Fox News will oblige me in allowing me to play the entire clip uninterrupted. So I've taken highlighted segments to try to give you an idea of just how badly this went. Things began to go downhill about two to three minutes into the interview, when Tucker Carlson is reading back statements that Kurt had made on social media, namely one concerning Donald Trump being institutionalized in a mental hospital. But the next day you say quite ironically, and I'm quoting, I believe Trump was institutionalized in a mental hospital for a nervous breakdown in 1990, which is why he won't release his medical records. This would devolve into at least five minutes of straight theatrics as Kurt did everything in his power to dodge giving an answer to the simple question which Tucker repeatedly asked him. And was he in a mental hospital in 1990, as you alleged, Let or was he not? Let me answer the question. Go ahead. You are, look, you're not fooling anybody. You're trying to stop me from giving the answer. <laughs> now that is impressive. You might not see bullshittery like that outside of a used car lot. But Kurt was actually able to take Tucker saying, go ahead, give me your answer, and turn that around into, you're not letting me answer the question. But he wasn't done there. 
Okay. So I think let's that go you're humiliating to, yourself by your unwillingness uh, to answer a simple question. So please answer it. I'm trying to answer the Do question. Do you have evidence he was in a mental hospital unlike in on your world, or don't you? Reality is not always able to give you a yes or no answer. Well, let's hop aboard the crazy train then and take that fucker all the way down to imagination land. Because apparently reality isn't going to allow Kurt to give us a coherent answer. Now this farce continued on for a good five solid minutes, inevitably leading Tucker to have to ask him another one. Jim and nobody's getting fooled. You're trying to How stop. can Newsweek employ you as a reporter, Kurt, when you're throwing <laughs> lines like this around that are untrue, that you can't substantiate, when you say to the president's Tucker, spokesman, you just F not, you, well, that's you, not the you, behavior that, of a look, reporter. Okay. Which is fairly sound. How could he be employed by Newsweek? How could he tweet out a public statement talking about a president-elect being institutionalized in a mental hospital and then refuse to expand on that? or to simply say, yes, that's true, or no, that is untrue. But if you thought that was bizarre, you haven't seen anything yet. Kurt wanted to kick it up a notch. He wanted to pull a bit of an emerald. He wanted to take that nutty and bring it all the way up to a nutty buddy. How about Begging this? I'm going to give you 30 answer seconds to answer this question. Do you have evidence that he was institutionalized no, in a mental hospital in 1990? That still on 30 the table. seconds. Now, okay, I will say this, because it's a message I've got from people from the CIA. Uh... I know a lot of officers, I know a lot of agents, I've been in their homes, and they're really delivering this to you and to Donald Trump. Uh, these are people who have sacrificed a lot for this country. Look at, look at his face. Look at that expression. That's the expression you get when you're sitting next to a fucking crazy person on the bus in the city. That is the expression you get when you are in a confined area and you're thinking to yourself, what's the nearest window I can jump out of before this person tries to stab me with a needle? It's, it's all in the eyebrows. He's communicating, he's communicating with those eyebrows that he's getting perhaps a little, a little scared. I have, con right I'm starting to get, have concerns have about you, in, Kurt. Right Just to, now, tell me what the, the secret message from the CIA is. Of course, much like the earlier question of, did you say this and is it true? Kurt's not going to give a clear answer on this one either. Instead, he's just going to keep freaking Tucker out to the point where he starts to express concerns about his well-being on a nationally televised news program. We're out of time, Kurt, and, and I don't mean this in a, in a cool way. I, I would have real concerns if liars, I were one of your editors, and I mean news. that. I'm not calling anyone a liar, but I am it's saying despicable. I'm concerned about your behavior on this show tonight. Now, I'm sure you can imagine the reception that Kurt had waiting for him upon arriving back on his Twitter account after the interview had concluded. It would be putting it mildly to say that people were enjoying themselves, tearing into him. And he didn't help matters much by trying to elaborate on the message the CIA had given him to pass along to Tucker Carlson. Good old Kurt Eichenwald, said by his peers to be meticulous and detail-focused, forgot to write it down. Oops, you know that super-secret message from the Central Intelligence Agency, forgot to write that down. Even though I had a giant binder when I was on your show from analyzing everything you said so I could bring it up to argue with you about, the message from the CIA directly to you, though, forgot to scribble that one down. Maybe it was up on the fridge next to bills that were due at the end of the month, and I, I just tossed it out without thinking about it. It's probably in the garbage with the cable bill. But to have a truly terrible day, you need more than one thing to go wrong. You need at least three of them. And here's number two. Amidst the fallout from the Tucker Carlson interview, as people were digging into him and mocking him for looking like an asshat, Sebastian Jones, a freelance journalist, decided to dredge up the entire Justin Berry situation, linking to previous articles and discussing inconsistencies with Kurt's reporting and questions that still surrounded what had happened. So there Kurt is, in the middle of a miniature shitstorm, one that he's helped to fuel with his appearance on television with questions about his past being dredged up. All of these horrible things being said by these mean, mean people on social media are all happening at once. What could possibly make it worse? I know. How about a seizure? Replying to Jew Goldstein, This is his wife. You caused a seizure. I have your information, and I called the police to report the assault. As if Kurt's luck wasn't bad enough on the 15th, he was memed in the first degree. So terribly so that he was on the floor shitting himself and seizing, and his wife had to take over his Twitter account to let everybody know about it. No, she didn't focus on her husband and his medical emergency. She wasn't holding his hand or telling the kids to get the car to come around. She was making sure all his Twitter followers knew that he was having an epileptic fit. She made sure to update everybody on his status, 
wanting to give those real-time updates, the things that people are really concerned about. His health can wait. His Twitter followers need the deets immediately. Now, this tragic event led Kurt to get in contact with law enforcement, with the FBI, with a lawyer, to subpoena Twitter to get the information of the user who had done this. And while the case was moving forward to identify this individual, to strip them of their anonymity, to arrest them for giffing somebody on Twitter, Kurt did the media tour. He went on Good Morning America to discuss the horrific events of that evening. Oh, uh, apparently, I can't look at my Twitter feed anymore, but apparently um, a lot of people find this very funny. Now, the man responsible, John Rain Ravioli Ravioli Rivioli, doesn't sound very Jewish. Maybe Goldstein is just a nickname his friends at college called him. He was arrested and charged and put on a $100,000 bail and was facing federal prosecution for cyber-stalking. However, those charges were dropped. He still does face one count of assault with a deadly weapon in Dallas County, a charge that carries a hate crime enhancement. On top of that, Kurt is suing him for monetary damages. While it may be a while before we see the final outcome of this case, and if giffing somebody on the internet is going to send you to prison, one thing does sort of stick out, and that is, once again, the convenient epilepsy coming to save Kurt from embarrassment or ridicule. Much like the case with Justin Berry, where he was having memory lapses to explain away the improprieties of paying a source, after Kurt had gone on national television in a disastrous appearance on Tucker Carlson, he suddenly was gift and had an epileptic fit leading to a seizure, which changed the news cycle. And that's not to say that Kurt doesn't have epilepsy, or that the epilepsy he may have triggers seizures. That is just to say that it is a remarkable coincidence. Of course, Kurt Eichenwald is a very remarkable individual. What other word could exist to help to describe a man who would go through the arduous research process of looking up tentacle porn to show his family? I like to build a world aside and furnish it with porn. Draw hentai pics and girls with dicks and tentacles galore. The seventh started out like any other day for Kurt on social media. He was doing his damnedest to make himself look like a fool in front of as many people as possible. On this particular day, he was trying to prove the validity of something he said was sent to him. It was a flyer warning about the Jews. But how could he go about that? People were doubting what he was telling them. And so Kurt, being the meticulous and detail-oriented type of person that he is, decided the best way to prove that he had this particular item, that this was sent to him in real life, was to pull out his phone and take a screen cap of it. So he held up that pamphlet right against his computer monitor and he snapped a picture. Now, for most people that browse the internet, be it an image board or a forum, you've probably come across a form of a meme, a, a joke that's floating out there, and maybe you've wondered why that exists. Who could possibly be so foolish as to do the following? The joke usually takes a form of somebody taking a screenshot of their desktop to point something out to other users at the community they're a part of. But included in that screenshot is a little more information than they were really willing to share. They slightly overlooked it. But who could really be that foolish? I mean, that's obviously a joke. Nobody would leave tabs open like that and make themselves look like a giant idiot. Well, there's always a basis in reality for everything. Kurt Eichenwald, he is a living example of somebody who did just that. Because if we analyze that picture he uploaded, if we go all CSI on it, you're going to notice something. There's a little tab present in the picture. You've just got to gotta zoom in a little bit. Clean that up. Zoom in a little bit more. What does that say? It looks like somebody, somebody already did the detective work for us. Hey, which tag was it that hooked you, Kurt? Below is the uh, the expanded version of what was on the tab on Kurt's computer. Let's uh let's take a look. Let's read through it and see what our journalist extraordinaire has been looking at. B. Chiku, English, Saha Decensored, male, dark skin, glasses, schoolboy uniform, female, BBW, big ass, big breasts, bike shorts, bikini blowjob, defloweration, face sitting, glasses, impregnation, milf, nakadashi. Schoolgirl uniform. Smell. <laughs> Stockings. Swimsuit teacher x-ray. Yuri. Hello, my name is Kurt Desu. I love Japan. Well, it would appear that that was some animated pornography, some hentai, that Kurt was looking up on his own, and he accidentally forgot to close the tab when he screen shared with his 
thousands of followers. I wonder what explanation he gave people. I'm sure something that was completely normal and reasonable and something that people didn't think was even weirder than the fact that he was sharing his favorite hentais with his followers. Sigh. Okay. I'm a dumbass. Believe it or not, my kids and I were trying to convince my wife that tentacle porn existed. I tried to find some to show her it was real, but I couldn't find any. And I ended up with this. My family reads my Twitter feed so they know this is true. You know, it was just a typical day in the Eichenwald household. Me, my kids, and my wife were all looking up hardcore hentai pornography because they didn't believe it really existed. And even though if you did a, a Google search just for the word tentacle porn, there would be a billion results. I couldn't find any. <laughs> I wasn't able. I wasn't able to find any. And I ended up with this. Well, that's a that's a little strange because when I'm looking at the tags that are included in this particular tweet, Kurt, I don't see anything related to tentacles in it. But maybe I need to pay closer attention to the uh, tags. Maybe let's see if we can puzzle it out. Why, why would you have stumbled on this one in your innocent search to show your children tentacle pornography? Well, there's, there's Nakadashi, which translates to pies. Now, I'm not sure what kind, of, what kind of pies those might be, Kurt. I'm sure they're creamy, but I don't think they're tentacle related. Big brass, no, blowjob, I, I don't think so. Could it be smell? Could you be smelling the octopus or squid that's coming to gang rape you? I mean, maybe. X-ray, I, I don't know. Maybe it's a schoolboy uniform, Gert. Maybe the schoolboy uniform's what drew you here. You know, in your search for tentacle pornography to share with your family. Within a day's time, Kurt tried a, a new tactic after being the object of ridicule for much of the internet and all the people on Twitter having a great laugh at his expense, he hit them with this gem. Even if I was reading Japanese porn, what would be the big deal? I've read porn in my life. Not into cartoons, though. Are you guys Puritans or eight? Stop being so uptight, soccer moms. So what if I like to hang out with the kids and the wife looking up hardcore hentai? That's a, that's a normal, red-blooded American thing to do. Like apple pie. Or as my honorable friends would say, apple Nakadashi. Now, originally, I had planned on leaving this as one long-form video, but Kurt being Kurt has given me so much content to work with, that's nearly impossible because even as I was working on this, even as I was editing it together, Kurt found himself once again in the middle of a miniature shitstorm which he had created. And so because of that, I'll be splitting the video here. I'll have the second part up tomorrow where we'll continue on with the magical adventures of Kurt Eichenwald. Everything from threatening to dox lawmakers, to threatening to sue or blackmail YouTubers, or getting into fight with school shooting survivors. And I'll finally be able to put forward my theory that I call the Kurt Eichenwald J-curve. And trust me when I tell you, we are only just getting started. Kurt has quite a ways down to go, and he is aiming for rock bottom. Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, Kurt Eichenwald is... <laughs> <laughs> threatening to sue me. Were you trying to get crazy with this thing? Don't you know I'm local? And it was a link to hardcore Japanese cartoon pornography. It exists. Konnichiwa, Oni-sons, and welcome back to part two, the conclusion to the Kurt Eichenwald experience. Within part one, we covered some of the earlier controversies within Kurt's journalism career, namely his coverage of Justin Berry, a young man who found himself at the center of a child pornography ring. We took a look at some of the allegations and doubts that his contemporaries and peers at the time had when it came to how he went about pursuing the story. And those misgivings journalists felt at the time still persist even till today. Just as recently as last year, WikiLeaks Task Force tweeted this out. Reporter Kurt Eichenwald was an administrator of a child porn site, claims he was only posing as an online predator. 7,000 retweets. A story that people were still very much interested in even 12 years down the road. 
We touched on Kurt's disastrous appearance on Tucker Carlson, where he informed the host of the Fox News show that he had a secret message from the CIA just for him. We looked at the assault by giffing that Kurt just barely survived while his wife tweeted out about his current medical condition. And finally, we finished off with Kurt's appreciation for Eastern animated pornography and his love of sharing that with his thousands upon thousands of Twitter followers. And I suppose that's really as good a segue as any to take a look at the bane of Kurt's life, his social media account and his interactions with other people. Because Kurt's behavior hasn't mellowed out or leveled off. If anything, it's escalated. And escalated repeatedly within a short period of time through his use of Twitter and other social media platforms. And one perfect example of just that would be when Kurt found himself in the middle of a fight between somebody within the comic book industry and somebody outside of it. I don't take these comic book things all that serious. And if you do, like, get a life. <laughs> 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 Get alive! <laughs> uh, Our journey begins back in mid-February when at Rebel Woman, Michelle Perez tweeted this out. Richard C. Meyer, a.k.a. the Diversity in Comics guy, he did a 30-minute video about a comic book circular that featured an article of mine. He's a multiple divorcee piece of shit. He's a war veteran, so of course he's a crypto-fascist. Unfortunately, an IED didn't blow him up. Now that tweet, one among many, was part of an ongoing internet feud dubbed Comicsgate. Now for those of you unfamiliar with it and looking for the basic gestalt or a hard and fast summary, Comicsgate is simply a dispute between those that enjoy a medium of entertainment and those within it who are seeking to change the direction the industry is going in, making it more progressive or politically correct and focusing on issues of social justice rather than entertaining the customer who's paying money for the product. This is a trend we've seen take place over the last decade in multiple different forms of media, be it television or movies or video games, and Comicsgate itself focuses on the comics book industry. Now, Richard C. Myers, the diversity and comics guy, the multiple divorcee piece of shit war veteran, as Michelle puts it, is somebody that's against this, that doesn't like this idea of shoehorning in progressive storylines within already existing franchises or in trying to dictate to the audience what they should enjoy rather than what they actually do enjoy. Michelle Perez, on the other hand, is a transsexual communist furry. Guess which side of this argument they're on? Within a few days of that tweet going up, Kurt stumbled across it. The most horrible person on Twitter today is at Rebel Woman, a comic book writer with Image Comics who wished an Afghan vet was killed by an IED and celebrated the deaths of a number of GOP and religious figures. I don't care if you don't like people's politics. This is obscene. So I condemned a comic writer for Image Comics for wishing an Afghan vet had died and celebrating conservative deaths. Then I got bombarded with outrage from comic book industry insiders. When did comics become evil political? And when did lunatics take over? I missed this event. Well, it seems that Richard and Kurt both uh, agree upon this. They both see the infiltration of an entertainment medium by those with a political agenda as a bad thing. So I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to be the best of friends going forward. So real brief uh, thing on uh, Kurt Eichenwald, so you can see him right here on the screen. Um, he's worked for a lot of big, uh, you know, Vanity Fair, MSNBC, New York Times. He's also very, very controversial and a real weirdo. So this is where the thesis of this comes in. I am not saying, Yahoo, Kurt Eichenwald's on my side. It's literally that there is a spectrum. And at one end is, you know, me and a bunch of normies. At the other end is all the SJW uh, comic book pros. And close to them, but between the normies and the, and the extremists are guys like this. Kurt Eichenwald is a grimy guy. <laughs> I would not leave any of my kids around him for a split second. Um, uh, I don't know if he's done anything actionable, but there's been little, and you can Google it, what he's... He's kind of been like tied to stuff. It gets really grimy. I don't know. If he was like your cousin, you'd uh, you'd probably invite him to the picnic, but you'd keep an eye on him. Or not. Or, or potentially not. But Kurt being that meticulous, detail-oriented, level-headed journalist we know, surely he took this well. Please let Diversity in Comics know to check his email. I defended him yesterday, and still do. Calling for the death of someone is wrong. However, today I am perfectly happy to start wrecking him if he ignores what I wrote to him. So all you loons, let him know.
And what exactly was the reckoning that Kurt was going to visit upon Richard? Beginning of the letter that Kurt Eichenwald just sent me. Read, respond, or I'm suing you. Richard, imagine for a minute that while in Afghanistan you saw a group of jihadists drowning children. Imagine that you run in and rescue them, resulting in children being saved and the jihadists captured. Then imagine some left-wing jerks change the story into you were drowning the children. Then imagine that a group of conservative jerks conclude that that's a convenient story against you, and say not only that you were drowning children, but that you went to jail for it. I saved children. Hundreds of them. I got pedophiles locked up, testified before Congress about it. Kids I saved testified about my rescue, and changed laws. Then left-wing pro-pedophile lunatics, yes, they exist, start a campaign of disinformation about what really happened. Journalists, incapable of reading documents and sworn testimony, or interviewing witnesses, pick up a story and tell the lunatic version without contacting me. Finally, two journalists tell the full story, but then right-wingers decided I was the enemy, took the left-wing lies, added to them, and spewed them out. You added a little more to the lies last night. You, unknowingly working with pedophiles and left-wing freaks, attacked a guy who saved kids and spun a series of lies about my career. You pulled garbage off the internet and pretended it was true. It would be as if I searched the internet, saw people calling you a Nazi, then wrote, not only is he a Nazi, but well, let's just say they don't want to leave any Jews nearby him if you want them to survive. So you're going to read this. You are going to correct the record with a new video that talks about how you were suckered into it by left-wing garbage used against you. Or I am going to finally stop the lies by using you as the end point by suing you. Now, I don't believe it has to get to that. You're a veteran. You have honor. You would, if you carry the principles you should, want to fix what you did. But if you want to push the line that a kid saver is a kid diddler, I have no problem using you as the declaration that this stops here. So you are going to do another video, apologizing to me. You are going to say that I sent you proof of what really happened, and that you fell for the left-wing garbage. And you are not going to mention the litigation threat, but rather present this as, he contacted me, he showed me the record, and I owe him an apology. Unlike the SJWs, you're going to admit you were wrong. And rather than doubling down, you're going to own up to it. Why am I bothering? Because this ends now. Because your deception to 50,000 people of the most noble thing my family ever did is somehow sordid and evil finally was the last straw. And because I believe military guys have integrity, unlike many, many journalists, I think you will care more about being right than about disclosing error. So I am loading you up with everything to show you the falsehood. Just taking down the video is not acceptable. If you tell the truth, I will have a video I can link to you showing you the falsity. If not, I can take you to court and prove it. Your choice. Unlike most of the bots and lunatics who spew this garbage, I know where you are. So I can take you to court and bring this to an end that way. Show integrity. Admit that condemning the guy who saved the drowning kids as a kid drowner based on internet bullshit is pure SJW type crap. Don't double down. So respond to this. Or go back to war. This time. With me. Now in that email from Kurt Eichenwald, aka the big boss from Zanzibar land, I think he was trying to impress Richard with his best Liam Neeson impersonation from the movie Taken. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you are looking for a ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I know where you are. I'm going to find you and we are going to go to war. Internet war. But it's not like Kurt Eichenwald became completely unhinged and began sending numerous emails like some drunken ex-girlfriend that just can't get the hint that you don't want to see her anymore. Oh, wait a minute. No, he did exactly that. He's, he did exactly that. But our little Kurt, he's not one to be deterred so easily. You may ignore his spamming your inbox like he's a Nigerian prince trying to get gold out of the U.S. from an uncle's account that's been long forgotten. Well, he'll just turn around and use a new tactic. It's amazing how brave people are on the internet, but who shrivel into little piles of pink dust when they are asked to show some sense of integrity by having direct conversation. Kurt, he didn't ask to talk to you, ever. He's never even mentioned your name before. You bulldozed your way in and insisted you had the right to his time and energy because you defended him, and then threatened him when he didn't give in to you, 
No means no. Follow me. Well now, is Ethan a brave man? Will he throw himself into the lion's den and open up those DM messages to Kurt? Ethan was kind enough to share their conversation with me. A bizarre, meandering conversation that seemed to go on for an eternity. I've taken a few highlights to give you the basic idea of how this conversation went down between the two of them. Now call me. Say so publicly. Lawsuit threat off the table. I'm saying it to you. I'm not making any public announcement until someone calls me and I get to have this conversation. Then you call Richard. Once we have made clear what reality is, I will announce. We don't negotiate with terrorists. You want to talk, you come as a friend. Then you call me. That's all I want. You call me, you talk to Richard, and I will say this is over. But you need to post that you were angry with the lawsuit threat, and it's off the table. I don't know why if someone says, pass the potatoes or I'll sue you, they don't just freaking pass the potatoes. He has, in writing, that there is no lawsuit threat if he contacts me. I have now amended that, that there is no lawsuit threat if you call me, and then you call him. Sorry, Kurt. Okay. Then the threat remains, and it looks like it is my only alternative. Pass the potatoes, or I'll sue the fuck out of you, lad. So if you've been following along at home, Kurt notices that a comic book industry insider is taking shots at a critic outside the comic book industry, decides to go in and defend him. That individual happened to read multiple articles about who Kurt Eichenwald is and isn't necessarily the most thrilled to have him on his side. Kurt doesn't take too kindly to that and responds with way too many emails saying he's going to sue the shit out of the guy if he doesn't create a new video and sing his praises to his audience. That YouTuber basically tells Kurt to go fuck himself. Kurt then gets a hold of somebody the YouTuber knows and demands that he calls him. And if he just will get on the phone and talk to Kurt, there won't be a lawsuit. But much like the YouTuber, his friend decides to say, maybe you should go fuck yourself instead. And Kurt doesn't take that so well. But it's not like Kurt Eichenwald really has a reputation for not overreacting. He likes to push the boundaries. He goes from being a reporter and into the sphere of an activist. Don't bring a knife to a bazooka fight. Journalist posts Oregon lawmakers' personal info online. Eichenwald went a step further on Friday, posting Post's social security number, in addition to his phone number and home address for Eichenwald's 454,000 Twitter followers and countless others to see. Eichenwald quickly deleted the information, saying he'd made his point. Eichenwald did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Eichenwald wrote to Post that it took me 25 seconds to get all the information about you, your wife, your son, tell him happy 25th, your neighbors, etc. Don't bring a knife to a bazooka fight. Now that I have demonstrated to Bill Post Oregon, I can get his home address, his personal phone number, and his social security number. I have deleted. However, Bill, one more time you take info submitted to legislature to dox people for disagreeing with you. It all goes back up. Apparently that little blue check mark is just like Captain America's shield, protecting Kurt from any backlash over posting social security numbers on Twitter. I'm fairly certain anybody without a blue check mark that did that would be deplatformed by Jack instantly. But it is interesting to see this coming from Kurt Eichenwald, somebody who repeatedly says that his family is targeted, that his children and wife face all sorts of terrible dangers from people that come after him, to then turn around and post the information of a lawmaker's family, to target his wife, his children, and his neighbors, simply to try to make a point. To go even farther than most people would go by posting social security numbers and then deleting them and bragging that if this guy steps out of line, he's going to hit him again. But could Kurt possibly one-up himself? I mean, it's only been about a week or two. What else is left for him to outdo himself? Well, I suppose there is going after the survivor of a school shooting, but surely Kurt wouldn't be that suicidal. Hopefully the Laura Ingram blow-up will teach conservatives you are not debating gun control when you insult survivors of a mass slaughter for advocating laws you don't agree with. You are just being infantile bullies. Want to debate policy? Great. Want to insult kids? Shut up. But he won't debate. Just ask Kyle, who offered. As I said, Kyle quickly made clear that his entire shtick is insults. I invited conservatives to a debate without invective, bringing exactly what you're told not to bring, and expecting to get accepted is how to get ignored. Wait, but Kurt, you literally just insulted a survivor. See how this game works. See, you went for a little while and I thought, hmm, this guy sounds reasonable. Let me look at Kyle again, but then, boom, back to the typical nonsense. If Kyle can demonstrate he can debate beyond slinging insults and conspiracy theories consistently, I will consider. Kyle, you continue to disappoint. Trafficking in fantasies, fine. Your followers are infantile. Your only form of debate is insult and you wonder why I have no respect for you. 
Well, that's a bit strange. How could Kurt instantly go from condemning Laura Ingram to doing exactly what he was condemning her for? I owe an apology to Kyle. I have no idea how many times I have commented to him. There is a high school kid who has a podcast who keeps challenging me to debates with insults. I mixed up their names. Please ignore every tweet I've sent. They were written for someone else. Last on this, this convo involving kid I mixed up with Kyle, they became mixed up because this kid's followers swarmed me, belittling my health, insulting me endlessly. I blocked many. Kyle is not responsible, but his followers did the same thing, which led to the confusion. I did not mix you up because his name was Kyle. I mixed you up because your followers suddenly attacked my feed with your tweet insulting me. It was the same thing that happened with the other kid, with the same vicious attacks on my disability. So I thought you were him. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Proactive. Been using for months and love your product. Don't love your support of MSNBC's Kurt Eichenwald. We are aware of this incident and have pulled our ads from the network as a result. We are working diligently. For those like Ben Shapiro who are taking my entire situation with Kyle to push a lie, I thought he was someone else. Stop going after MSNBC. My contributor contact with them expired more than a month ago. Not with them. Need to edit my profile. Good old Kurt Eichenwald. Even when he's not employed with you, he somehow finds a way to get your advertisers pulled. That is impressive. He can destroy a business just by people thinking he's associated with them. With all these constant shitstorms and fuck-ups on the part of Kurt, you have to wonder where can he go from here? What other mountain is left to climb after the disasters and catastrophes that he has left in his own wake? When he's not busy destroying his own reputation as a journalist, he's making sure those who were former associates of him are losing business. Well, while I'm not able to exactly foresee the future, I can bring a little theory into play on what might be happening and where this might end up going. But to do that, I'm going to need to break out a graph. Now, on the horizontal, we have time. And on the vertical, we have insanity. And there's our little Kurt. That's from around, let's say, 2005-ish. That would be back during his Justin Berry article and then all the fallout from that. So, you know, it's a, it's a roughly a two-year period, but that's our starting point. And then we've got a gap, about 10 years, let's say a decade. Now, I'm sure that Kurt, knowing Kurt, did some really retarded shit in that time frame, but I'm just unaware of it. So I call this the Dark Ages of Kurt. I don't know what happened in there. I can't even speculate on it. It's a missing gap. But after we move past that Dark Ages period we start to see a lot of activity take place in a very short amount of time. The hentai incident, threatening to sue YouTubers, doxing lawmakers, going after school shooter survivors, until finally we reach the point where we are right now with the current day Kurt. Now if you were to draw a little line, if you were to connect all of these points, from our starting position in 2005 down into the dead unknown period of the Dark Ages, all the way up into the current year, you get a nice little a nice little J curve showing up. And that's what I like to call the Eichenwald J curve. You'll notice that as time goes on, the incidents of insanity increase exponentially. And this is where we are right now. I like to call this the danger zone. Because you don't want to fly anywhere near it. But hey, what do I know? I'm just some lunatic alt-writer launching a mega attack against poor innocent Kurt. Apparently he's under the impression that YouTube videos and Twitter are like Pokemon battles. Then again, it was super effective. So what's next for Kurt? Where does he go from here? Well, judging from the information we can gleam from the J-curve, it's pretty easy to speculate that sometime in the next, I don't know, day to a week, he's going to do something even stupider than what he's done before. You can see that each incident of him embarrassing himself or sullying his own reputation begins to increase in frequency as time goes on. What used to take a year or a month or a week is now a day or an hour. He's a real-life version of The Flash if The Flash was a giant fuck-up that kept tripping over his own two feet. But I suppose we're going to have to wait for him to leave hibernation before we can be sure about this. And knowing Kurt, he can't stay away from social media for too long. After all, he's going to have a lot of free time on his hands not working for Newsweek or MSNBC or really anybody else. I just can't understand why nobody wants to hire this amazing, 